This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 7 Solomon's Road Outside the cavern we halted, feeling rather foolish. I am going back, said Sir Henry. Why? asked Good. Because it has struck me that what we saw may be my brother. This was a new idea, and we re-entered the place to put it to the proof. After the bright light outside, our eyes, weak as they were with staring at the snow, could not pierce the gloom of the cave for a while. Presently, however, they grew accustomed to the semi-darkness, and we advanced towards the dead man. Sir Henry knelt down and peered into his face. "'Thank God,' he said with a sigh of relief. "'It is not my brother.' Then I drew near and looked. The body was that of a tall man in middle life with aquiline features, grizzled hair, and a long black moustache. The skin was perfectly yellow and stretched tightly over the bones. Its clothing, with the exception of what seemed to be the remains of a woolen pair of hose, had been removed, leaving the skeleton-like frame naked. Round the neck of the corpse, which was frozen perfectly stiff, hung a yellow ivory crucifix. "'Who on earth can it be?' said I. "'Can't you guess?' asked Good. I shook my head. "'Why, the old Dom, José da Silvestra, of course. Who else?' "'Impossible,' I gasped. "'He died three hundred years ago. "'And what is there to prevent him from lasting for three thousand years in this atmosphere, I should like to know?' asked Good. "'If only the temperature is sufficiently low, flesh and blood will keep fresh as New Zealand mutton forever, and heaven knows it is cold enough here.' The sun never gets in here, no animal comes here to tear or destroy. No doubt his slave, of whom he speaks on the writing, took off his clothes and left him. He could not have buried him alone. Look, he went on, stooping down to pick up a queerly shaped bone, scraped at the end into a sharp point. Here is the cleft bone that Silvestra used to draw the map with. We gazed for a moment, astonished, forgetting our own miseries in this extraordinary, and as it seemed to us, semi-miraculous sight. Ay, said Sir Henry, and this is where he got his ink from, and he pointed to a small wound on the dom's left arm. Did ever man see such a thing before? There was no longer any doubt about the matter which for my own part, I confess, perfectly appalled me. There he sat, the dead man, whose directions, written some ten generations ago, had led us to this spot. Here in my own hand was the rude pen with which he had written them, and about his neck hung the crucifix that his dying lips had kissed. Gazing at him, my imagination could reconstruct the last scene of the drama, the traveller dying of cold and starvation, yet striving to convey to the world the great secret which he had discovered, the awful loneliness of his death, up which the evidence sat before us. It even seemed to me that I could trace in his strongly marked features a likeness to those of my poor friend, Silvestre, his descendant, who had died twenty years before in my arms, but perhaps that was fancy. At any rate, there he sat, a sad memento of the fate that so often overtakes those who would penetrate into the unknown. And there, doubtless, he will still sit, crowned with the dread majesty of death. For centuries yet unborn, to startle the eyes of wanderers like ourselves, 
if ever any such should come again to invade his loneliness. The thing overpowered us, already almost perished as we were with cold and hunger. Let us go, said Sir Henry in a low voice. Stay, we will give him a companion. And lifting up the dead body of the Hottentot Ventvogel, he placed it near to that of the old Dom. Then he stooped, and with a jerk broke the rotten string of the crucifix, which hung round Da Silvestre's neck, for his fingers were too cold to attempt to unfasten it. I believe that he has it still. I took the bone pen, and it is before me as I write. Sometimes I use it to sign my name. Then, leaving these two, the proud white man of a past age and the poor Hottentot, to keep their eternal vigil in the midst of the eternal snows, we crept out of the cave into the welcome sunshine and resumed our path, wondering in our hearts how many hours it would be before we were even as they are. When we had walked about half a mile, we came to the edge of the plateau, for the nipple of the mountain does not rise out of its exact center, though from the desert side it had seemed to do so. What lay below us we could not see, for the landscape was wreathed in billows of morning fog. Presently, however, the higher layers of mist cleared a little and revealed, at the end of a large slope of snow, a patch of green grass some five hundred yards beneath us, through which a stream was running. Nor was this all. By the stream, basking in the bright sun, stood and lay a group of from ten to fifteen large antelopes. At that distance we could not see of what species. The sight filled us with unreasoning joy. If only we could get it, there was food in plenty. But the question was how to do so. The beasts were fully six hundred yards off, a very long shot, and one not to be depended on when our lives hung on the results. Rapidly we discussed the advisability of trying to stalk the game, but in the end dismissed it reluctantly. To begin with, the wind was not favorable, and further we must certainly be perceived, however careful we were, against the blinding background of snow which we should be obliged to traverse. "'Well, we must have a try from where we are,' said Sir Henry. "'Which shall it be, Quartermain, the repeating rifles or the expresses?' Here again was a question. The Winchester repeaters, of which we had two, Umbopa carrying poor Ventvogels as well as his own, were sighted up to a thousand yards, whereas the expresses were only sighted to 350, beyond which shooting with them was more or less guesswork. On the other hand, if they did hit, the express bullets, being expanding, were much more likely to bring the game down. It was a knotty point, but I made up my mind that we must risk it and use the expresses. Let each of us take the buck opposite to him. Aim well at the point of the shoulder and high up, said I, and Umbopa, do you give the word so that we may all fire together. Then came a pause, each of us aiming his level best, as indeed a man is likely to do when he knows that life itself depends upon the shot. Fire, said Umbopa in Zulu, and at almost the same instant the three rifles rang out loudly. Three clouds of smoke hung for a moment before us, and a hundred echoes went flying over the silent snow. Presently the smoke cleared and revealed, oh joy, a great buck lying on its back and kicking furiously in its death agony. We gave a yell of triumph. We were saved. We should not starve. Weak as we were, we rushed down the intervening slope of snow, and in ten minutes from the time of shooting, that animal's heart and liver were lying before us. But now a new difficulty arose. We had no fuel, and therefore could make no fire to cook them. We gazed at each other in dismay. Starving men should not be fanciful, said Good. We must eat raw meat. 
There was no other way out of the dilemma, and our gnawing hunger made the proposition less distasteful than it would otherwise have been. So we took the heart and liver and buried them for a few minutes in a patch of snow to cool them. Then we washed them in the ice-cold water of the stream, and lastly ate them greedily. It sounds horrible enough, but honestly I never tasted anything so good as that raw meat. In a quarter of an hour we were changed men. Our life and vigor came back to us. Our feeble pulses grew strong again, and the blood went coursing through our veins. But mindful of the results of overfeeding on starved stomachs, we were careful not to eat too much, stopping whilst we were still hungry. "'Thank heavens,' said Sir Henry. "'That brute has saved our lives. "'What is it, Quartermain?' I rose and went to look at the antelope, for I was not certain. It was about the size of a donkey with large curved horns. I had never seen one like it before. The species was new to me. It was brown in color, with faint red stripes, and grew a thick coat. I afterwards discovered that the natives of that wonderful country call these bucks Inco. They are very rare and only found at a great altitude where no other game will live. This animal was fairly hit high up in the shoulder, though whose bullet brought it down we could not, of course, discover. I believe that Good, mindful of his marvelous shot at the giraffe, secretly set it down to his own prowess, and we did not contradict him. We had been so busy satisfying our hunger that hitherto we had not found time to look about us. But now, having set Umbopa to cut off as much of the best meat as we were likely to be able to carry, we began to inspect our surroundings. The mist had cleared away, for it was eight o'clock, and the sun had sucked it up, so we were able to take in all the country before us at a glance. I know not how to describe the glorious panorama which unfolded itself to our gaze, I have never seen anything like it before, nor shall, I suppose, again. Behind and over us towered Sheba's snowy breasts, and below, some five thousand feet beneath where we stood, lay league on league of the most lovely champagne country. Here were dense patches of lofty forest. There a great river wound its silvery way. To the left stretched a vast expanse of rich undulating veld or grassland, whereon we could just make out countless herds of game or cattle. At that distance we could not tell which. This expanse appeared to be ringed in by a wall of distant mountains. To the right the country was more or less mountainous, that is, solitary hills stood up from its level, with stretches of cultivated land between, amongst which we could see groups of dome-shaped huts. The landscape lay before us as a map, wherein rivers flashed like silver snakes, and alp-like peaks, crowned with wildly twisted snow wreaths, rose in grandeur, whilst over all was the glad sunlight and the breath of nature's happy life. Two curious things struck us as we gazed. First, that the country before us must lie at least 3,000 feet higher than the desert we had crossed, and secondly, that all the rivers flowed from south to north. As we had painful reason to know, there was no water upon the southern side of the vast range on which we stood, but on the northern face were many streams, most of which appeared to unite with the great river we could see winding away farther than our eyes could follow. We sat down for a while and gazed in silence at this wonderful view. Presently Sir Henry spoke. "'Isn't there something on the map about Solomon's great road?' he said. I nodded, for I was still gazing out over the far country. "'Well, look, there it is,' and he pointed a little to our right. Good and I looked accordingly, and there, winding away towards the plain, was what appeared to be a wide turnpike road. We had not seen it at first, because, 
On reaching the plain, it turned behind some broken country. We did not say anything, at least not much. We were beginning to lose the sense of wonder. Somehow it did not seem particularly unnatural that we should find a sort of Roman road in this strange land. We accepted the fact, that was all. "'Well,' said Good, "'must be quite near us if we cut off the, to the right. "'Hadn't we better be making a start?' "'This was sound advice, "'and so soon as we had washed our faces and hands in the stream, "'we acted on it. "'For a mile or more we made our way over boulders "'and across patches of snow, "'till suddenly, on reaching the top of the little rise, "'we found the road at our feet.' It was a splendid road, cut out of the solid rock, at least fifty feet wide, and apparently well kept, though the odd thing was that it seemed to begin there. We walked down and stood on it, but one single hundred paces behind us, in the direction of Sheba's breasts, it vanished, the entire surface of the mountain being strewn with boulders interspaced with patches of snow. "'What do you make of this, Quartermain?' asked Sir Henry. "'I shook my head. I could make nothing of the thing. "'I have it,' said Good. "'The road, no doubt, ran right over the range and across the desert on the other side. "'But the sand there has covered it up, "'and above us it has been obliterated by some volcanic eruption of molten lava.' This seemed a good suggestion, at any rate we accepted it, and proceeded down the mountain. It proved a very different business traveling along downhill on that magnificent pathway with full stomachs from what it was traveling uphill over the snow quite starved and almost frozen. Indeed, had it not been for melancholy recollections of poor Ventvogel's sad fate, and of that grim cave where he kept company with the old dom, we should have felt positively cheerful, notwithstanding the sense of unknown dangers before us. Every mile we walked, the atmosphere grew softer and balmier, and the country before us shone with a yet more luminous beauty. As for the road itself, I never saw such an engineering work though Sir Henry said that the great road over the St. Gothard in Switzerland is very similar. No difficulty had been too great for the old-world engineer who laid it out. At one place we came to a ravine three hundred feet broad and at least a hundred feet deep. This vast gulf was actually filled in with huge blocks of dressed stone, having arches pierced through them at the bottom for a waterway, over which the road went on sublimely. At another place it was cut in zigzags out of the side of a precipice 500 feet deep, and in a third it tunneled through the base of an intervening ridge, a space of 30 yards or more. Here we noticed that the sides of the tunnel were covered with quaint sculptures, mostly of mailed figures driving in chariots. One, which was exceedingly beautiful, represented a whole battle scene with a convoy of captives being marched off in the distance. Well, said Sir Henry, after inspecting this ancient work of art, it is very well to call this Solomon's Road, but my humble opinion is that the Egyptians had been here before Solomon's people ever set a foot on it. If this isn't Egyptian or Phoenician handiwork, I must say that it is very like it. By midday we had advanced sufficiently down the mountain to search the region where wood was to be met with. First we came to scattered bushes, which grew more and more frequent, till at last we found the road winding through a vast grove of silver trees similar to those which are to be seen on the slopes of Table Mountain at Cape Town. I had never before met with them in all my wanderings, except at the Cape, and their appearance here astonished me greatly. Ah, said Good, surveying these shining-leaved trees with evident enthusiasm, here is lots of wood. Let us stop and cook some dinner. I have about digested that raw heart. 
Nobody objected to this. So leaving the road, we made our way to a stream which was babbling away not far off, and soon had a goodly fire of dry boughs blazing. Cutting off some substantial hunks from the flesh of the inco which we had brought with us, we proceeded to toast them on the end of sharp sticks, as one sees the kaffirs do, and ate them with relish. After filling ourselves, we lit our pipes and gave ourselves up to enjoyment that, compared with the hardships we had recently undergone, seemed almost heavenly. The brook, of which the banks were clothed with dense masses of a gigantic species of maidenhair fern, interspersed with feathery tufts of wild asparagus, sung merrily at our side. The soft air murmured through the leaves of the silver trees, doves cooed around, and bright-winged birds flashed like living gems from bough to bough. It was a paradise. The magic of the place, combined with an overwhelming sense of dangers left behind, and of the promised land reached at last, seemed to charm us into silence. Sir Henry and Umbopa sat conversing in a mixture of broken English and kitchen Zulu in a low voice, but earnestly enough, and I lay with my eyes half shut upon that fragrant bed of fern and watched them. Presently I missed Good, and I looked to see what had become of him. Soon I observed him sitting by the bank of the stream in which he had been bathing. He had nothing on but his flannel shirt, and his natural habits of extreme neatness having reasserted themselves, he was actively employed in making a most elaborate toilet. He had washed his gutta-percha collar, had thoroughly shaken out his trousers, coat and waistcoat, and was now folding them up neatly till he was ready to put them on, shaking his head sadly as he scanned the numerous rents and tears in them, which naturally had resulted from our frightful journey. Then he took his boots, scrubbed them with a handful of fern, and finally rubbed them over with a piece of fat, which he had carefully saved from the inco meat, till they looked, comparatively speaking, respectable. Having inspected them judiciously through his eyeglass, he put the boots on and began a fresh operation. From a little bag that he carried, he produced a pocket comb in which was fixed a tiny looking glass, and in this he surveyed himself. Apparently he was not satisfied, for he proceeded to do his hair with great care. Then came a pause while he again contemplated the effect. Still it was not satisfactory. He felt his chin, on which the accumulated scrub of a ten days' beard was flourishing. Surely, thought I, he is not going to try to shave, but so it was. Taking the piece of fat with which he had greased his boots, Good washed it thoroughly in the stream. Then, diving again into the bag, he brought out a little pocket razor with a guard to it, such as are bought by people who are afraid of cutting themselves, or by those about to undertake a sea voyage. Then he rubbed his face and chin vigorously with the fat and began. Evidently, it proved a painful process, for he groaned very much over it, and I was convulsed with inward laughter as I watched him struggling with that stubbly beard. It seems so very odd that a man should take the trouble to shave himself with a piece of fat in such a place and in our circumstances. At last he succeeded in getting the hair off the right side of his face and chin, when suddenly I, who was watching, became conscious of a flash of light that passed just by his head. Good sprang up with a profane exclamation. If it had not been a safety razor, he would certainly have cut his throat. And so did I, without the exclamation, and this was what I saw. Standing not more than twenty paces from where I was, and ten from good, were a group of men. They were very tall and copper-colored, and some of them wore great plumes of black feathers and short cloaks of leopard skins. This was all I noticed at the moment. In front of them stood a youth of about seventeen, his hand still raised and his body bent forward in the attitude of a Grecian statute of a spear-thrower. Evidently the flash of light had been caused by a weapon which he had hurled. As I looked, an old soldier-like man stepped forward out of the group 
and catching the youth by the arm said something to him. Then they advanced upon us. Sir Henry, Good, and Umbopa by this time had seized their rifles and lifted them threateningly. The party of natives still came on. It struck me that they could not know what rifles were, or they would not have treated them with such contempt. "'Put down your guns!' I hallowed to the others, seeing that our only chance of safety lay in conciliation. They obeyed, and walking to the front I addressed the elderly man who had checked the youth. "'Greetings,' I said in Zulu, not knowing what language to use. To my surprise I was understood. "'Greeting,' answered the old man, not indeed in the same tongue, but in a dialect so closely allied to it that neither Umbopa nor myself had any difficulty in understanding him. Indeed, as we afterwards found out, the language spoken by this people is an old-fashioned form of the Zulu tongue, bearing about the same relationship to it that the English of Chaucer does to the English of the 19th century. "'Whence come you?' he went on. "'Who are you, and why are the faces of three of you white, "'and the face of the fourth as the face of our mother's sons?' "'And he pointed to Umbopa. "'I looked at Umbopa as he said it, "'and it flashed across me that he was right. "'The face of Umbopa was like the faces of the men before me, "'and so was his great form like their forms.' "'but I had not time to reflect on this coincidence. "'We are strangers and come in peace,' I answered, "'speaking very slowly, so that he might understand me. "'And this man is our servant.' "'You lie,' he answered. "'No strangers can cross the mountains where all things perish. "'But what do your lies matter? "'If ye are strangers, then ye must die, "'for no strangers may live in the land of the Kukuanas. It is the king's law. Prepare then to die, O strangers. I was slightly staggered at this, more especially as I saw the hands of some of the men steal down to their sides, where hung on each what looked to me like a large and heavy knife. What does the beggar say? asked Good. He says we are going to be killed, I answered grimly. Oh, Lord, groaned Good. And, as was his way, when perplexed, he put his hand to his false teeth, dragging the top set down and allowing them to fly back to his jaw with a snap. It was a most fortunate move, for next second the dignified crown of Kukuanas uttered a simultaneous yell of horror and bolted back some yards. "'What's up?' said I. "'It's his teeth,' whispered Sir Henry excitedly. "'He moved them.' "'Take them out, Good. Take them out.' "'He obeyed, slipping the set into the sleeve of his flannel shirt. "'In another second, curiosity had overcome fear, and the men advanced slowly. "'Apparently they had now forgotten their amiable intention of killing us. "'How is it, O oh strangers?' asked the old man solemnly. "'That this fat man, pointing to Good, who was clad in nothing but boots and a flannel shirt, and had only half finished his shaving, whose body is clothed and whose legs are bare, who grows hair on one side of his sickly face and not on the other, and who wears one shining and transparent eye. How is it, I ask, that he has teeth which move of themselves, coming away from the jaws and returning of their own will? Open your mouth, I said to Good who promptly curled up his lips and grinned at the old gentleman like an angry dog, revealing to his astonished gaze two thin red lines of gum as utterly innocent of ivories as a newborn elephant. The audience gasped. "'Where are his teeth?' they shouted. "'With our eyes we saw them.' Turning his head slowly and with a gesture of ineffable contempt, Good swept his hand across his mouth. Then he grinned again, and lo, there were two rows of lovely teeth. Now the young man who had flung the knife threw himself down on the grass and gave vent to a prolonged howl of terror, and as for the old gentleman, his knees knocked together with fear. 
"'I see that ye are spirits,' he said falteringly. "'Did ever man born of woman have hair on one side of his face and not on the other, "'or a round and transparent eye, or teeth which moved and melted away and grew again? "'Pardon us, O my lords.' "'Here was luck indeed, and needless to say I jumped at the chance. "'It is granted,' I said with an imperial smile. "'Nay, ye shall know the truth. "'We come from another world, though we are men such as ye. "'We come,' I went on, "'from the biggest star that shines at night.' "'Oh, oh!' groaned the chorus of astonished Aborigines. "'Yes,' I went on, "'we do indeed.' "'And again I smiled benignly "'as I uttered that amazing lie. "'We come to stay with you a little while.' and to bless you by our sojourn. Ye will see, O oh friends, that I have prepared myself for this visit by the learning of your language. It is so, it is so, said the chorus. Only, my lord, put in the old gentleman, thou hast learned it very badly. I cast an indignant glance at him, and he quailed. Now, friends, I continued, ye might think that after so long a journey we should find it in our hearts to avenge such a reception. Mayhap to strike cold in death the imperious hand that, that in short, threw a knife at the head of him whose teeth come and go. Spare him, my lords, said the old man in supplication. He is the king's son, and I am his uncle. If anything befalls him, his blood will be required at my hands. "'Yes, that is certainly so,' put in the young man with great emphasis. "'Ye may perhaps doubt our power to avenge,' I went on, heedless of this by-play. "'Stay, I will show you. "'Here, thou dog and slave,' addressing Umbopa in a savage tone, "'give me the magic tube that speaks,' and I tipped a wink towards my express rifle. "'Umbopa rose to the occasion,' and with something as nearly resembling a grin as I have ever seen on his dignified face, he handed me the gun. It is here, O Lord of Lords, he said, with a deep obeisance. Now just before I had asked for the rifle, I had perceived a little Klipspringer antelope standing on a mass of rock about seventy yards away, and determined to risk the shot. You see that buck? I said, pointing the animal out to the party before me. Tell me, is it possible for man born of woman to kill it from here with a noise? It is not possible, my lord, answered the old man. Yet shall I kill it, I said quietly. The old man smiled. That my lord cannot do, he answered. I raised the rifle and covered the buck. It was a small animal, and one which a man might well be excused for missing, but I knew that it would not do to miss. I drew a deep breath and slowly pressed on the trigger. The buck stood still as a stone. Bang! Thud! The antelope sprang into the air and fell on the rock dead as a doornail. A groan of simultaneous terror burst from the group before us. "'If you want meat,' I remarked coolly, "'go fetch that buck.' The old man made a sign, and one of his followers departed, and presently returned, bearing the clipspringer. I noticed with satisfaction that I had hit it fairly behind the shoulder. They gathered round the poor creature's body, gazing at the bullet hole in consternation." "'Ye see,' I said, "'I do not speak empty words.' "'There was no answer. "'If ye yet doubt our power,' I went on, "'let one of you go and stand upon that rock "'that I may make him as this buck.' "'None of them seemed at all inclined to take the hint, "'till at last the king's son spoke. "'It is well said. "'Do thou, my uncle, go stand upon the rock.' It is but a buck that the magic has killed. Surely it cannot kill a man. The old gentleman did not take the suggestion in good part. Indeed, he seemed hurt. 
"'No, no!' he ejaculated hastily. "'My old eyes have seen enough. "'These are wizards indeed. "'Let us bring them to the king. "'Yet if any should wish a further proof, "'let him stand upon the rock, "'that the magic tube may speak with him.' "'There was a most general and hasty expression of dissent. "'Let not good magic be wasted on our poor bodies,' said one. "'We are satisfied. "'All the witchcraft of our people cannot show the like of this.' "'It is so,' remarked the old gentleman, in a tone of intense relief. "'Without any doubt, it is so. "'Listen, children of the stars, children of the shining eye and the movable teeth, "'who roar out in thunder and slay from afar. "'I am Infadus, son of Kafa, once king of the Kukuana people. "'This youth is Skraga. "'He nearly scragged me,' murmured Good. Scraga, son of Twala, the great king, Twala, husband of a thousand wives, chief and lord paramount of the Kukuanas, keeper of the great road, terror of his enemies, student of the black arts, leader of a hundred thousand warriors, Twala, the one-eyed, the black, the terrible. So, said I superciliously, lead us then to Twala. We do not talk with low people and underlings. It is well, my lords. We will lead you, but the way is long. We are hunting three days' journey from the place of the king. But let my lords have patience, and we will lead them. So be it, I said carelessly. All time is before us, for we do not die. We are ready. Lead on. But in Fadus and thou, Scraga, beware. Play no monkey tricks. Set for us no foxes' snares, for before your brains of mud have thought of them, we shall know and avenge. The light of the transparent eye of him with the bare legs and the half-haired face shall destroy you and go through your land. His vanishing teeth shall affix themselves fast in you and eat you up, you and your wives and children." The magic tubes shall argue with you loudly, and make you as sieves. Beware. This magnificent address did not fail of its effects. Indeed, it might almost have been spared, so deeply were our friends already impressed with our powers. The old man made a deep obeisance, and murmured the words, Kum, Kum, which I afterwards discovered was their royal salute corresponding to the Baete of the Zulus, and turning addressed his followers. These at once proceeded to lay hold of all our goods and chattels in order to bear them for us, accepting only the guns which they would on no account touch. They even seized goods clothes that, as the reader may remember, were neatly folded up beside him. He saw and made a dive for them, and a loud altercation ensued. Let not my lord of the transparent eye and the melting teeth touch them, said the old man. Surely his slave shall carry the things. But I want to put them on, roared Good in nervous English. Umbopa translated. Nay, my lord, answered Infadus. Would my lord cover up his beautiful white legs? Although he is so dark, Good has a singularly white skin. From the eye of his servants? Have we offended my lord that he should do such a thing? Here I nearly exploded with laughing, and meanwhile one of the men started on with the garments. Damn it! roared Good. That black villain has got my trousers. Look here, Good, said Sir Henry. You have appeared in this country in a certain character, and you must live up to it. It will never do for you to put on trousers again. Henceforth you must exist in a flannel shirt, a pair of boots, and an eyeglass. Yes, I said, and with whiskers on one side of your face and not on the other. If you change any of these things, the people will think that we are impostors. I am very sorry for you, but seriously you must. If once they begin to suspect us, our lives will not be worth a brass farthing. 
"'Do you really think so?' said Good gloomily. "'I do indeed. "'Your beautiful white legs and your eyeglass "'are now the features of our party, "'and as Sir Henry says, you must live up to them. "'Be thankful that you've got your boots on "'and that the air is warm.' "'Good sighed and said no more.' but it took him a fortnight to become accustomed to his new and scant attire. End of chapter 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 8 we enter Kukuana land. All that afternoon we traveled along the magnificent roadway, which trended steadily in the northwesterly direction. Infadus and Skraga walked with us, but their followers marched about one hundred paces ahead. Infadus, I said at length, who made this road? It was made, my lord, of old time, none know how or when, not even the wise woman Gagul, who has lived for generations. We are not old enough to remember its making. None can fashion such roads now, but the king suffers no grass to grow upon it. And whose are the writings on the wall of the caves through which we have passed on the road, I asked, referring to the Egyptian-like sculptures that we had seen. "'My lord, the hands that made the road wrote the wonderful writings. "'We know not who wrote them. "'When did the Kukuana people come into this country?' "'My lord, the race came down here like the breath of a storm ten thousand thousand moons ago, "'from the great lands which lie there beyond,' and he pointed to the north. "'They could travel no further because of the high mountains which ring in the land.' So say the old voices of our fathers that have descended to us the children, and so says Gagul the wise woman, the smeller out of witches. And again he pointed to the snow-clad peaks. The country, too, was good, so they settled here, and grew strong and powerful, and now our numbers are like the sea sand. And when Twala the king calls up his regiments, their plumes cover the plain so far as the eye of man can reach. And if the land is walled in with mountains, who is there for the regiments to fight with? Nay, my lord, the country is open there towards the north, and now and again warriors sweep down upon us in clouds from a land we know not, and we slay them. It is the third part of the life of a man since there was a war. Many thousands died in it, but we destroyed those who came to eat us up. So since then there has been no war. Your warriors must grow weary of resting on their spears, Infadus. My lord, there was one war just after we destroyed the people that came down upon us. But it was a civil war. Dog ate dog. How was that? My lord the king, my half-brother, had a brother born at the same birth and of the same woman. It is not our custom, my lord, to suffer twins to live. The weaker always must die. But the mother of the king hid away the feeble child, which was born the last, for her heart yearned over it, and that child is Twala, the king. I am his younger brother, born of another wife. Well... My lord, Kafa, our father, died when we came to manhood, and my brother Imotu was made king in his place, and for a space reigned and had a son by his favorite wife. When the babe was three years old, just after the great war, during which no man could sow or reap, a famine came upon the land, and the people murmured because of the famine, and looked round like a starved lion for something to rend. Then it was that Gagul, the wise and terrible woman who does not die, made a proclamation to the people, saying, The king Imotu is no king. 
and at the time Imotu was sick with a wound and lay in his kraal, not able to move. Then Gagul went into a hut and led out Twala, my half-brother and twin-brother to the king, whom she had hidden among the caves and rocks since he was born, and stripping the muka waistcloth off his loins, showed the people of the Kukuanas the mark of the sacred snake coiled round his middle, wherewith the eldest son of the king is marked at birth, and cried out loud, Behold your king whom I have saved for you even to this day. Now the people being mad with hunger, and altogether bereft of reason and the knowledge of truth, cried out, The king! The king! But I knew that it was not so, for Emotu my brother was the elder of the twins, and our lawful king. Then, just as the tumult was at its height, Emotu the king, though he was very sick, crawled from his hut, holding his wife by the hand, and followed by his little son Ignosi, that is, by interpretation, the lightning. "'What is this noise?' he asked. "'Why cry ye, the king, the king?' Then Twala, his twin brother, born of the same woman and in the same hour, ran to him, and taking him by the hair, stabbed him through the heart with his knife. And the people, being fickle and ever ready to worship the rising sun, clapped their hands and cried, Twala is king. Now we know that Twala is king. And what became of Imotu's wife and her son Ignosi? Did Twala kill them too? Nay, my lord. When she saw that her lord was dead, the queen seized the child with a cry and ran away. Two days afterward she came to a kraal very hungry, and none would give her milk or food now that her lord the king was dead, for all men hate the unfortunate. But at nightfall a little child, a girl, crept out and brought her corn to eat, and she blessed the child and went on towards the mountains with her boy before the sun rose again. And there she must have perished, for none have seen her since nor the child Ignosi. Then if this child Ignosi had lived, he would be the true king of the Kukuana people? That is so, my lord, the sacred snake is round his middle. If he lives, he is king. But alas, he is long dead. See, my lord, and Infadus pointed to a vast collection of huts surrounded by a fence, which was in its turn encircled by a great ditch, that lay on the plain beneath us. That is the kraal where the wife of Imotu was last seen with the child Ignosi. It is there that we shall sleep tonight, if indeed, he added doubtfully, my lords sleep at all upon this earth. When we are among the Kukuanas, my good friend Infadus, we do as the Kukuanas do, I said majestically, and turned round quickly to address good, who was tramping along sullenly behind, his mind fully occupied with unsatisfactory attempts to prevent his flannel shirt from flapping in the evening breeze. To my astonishment, I butted into Umbopa, who was walking along immediately behind me, and very evidently had been listening with the greatest interest to my conversation with Infadus. The expression on his face was most curious, and gave me the idea of a man who was struggling with partial success to bring something long forgotten back into his mind. All this while we had been pressing on at a good rate towards the undulating plain beneath us. The mountains we had crossed now loomed high above our heads, and Sheba's breasts were veiled modestly in diaphanous wreaths of mist. As we went the country grew more and more lovely, the vegetation was luxuriant, without being tropical. The sun was bright and warm, but not burning. And a gracious breeze blew softly along the odorous slopes of the mountain. Indeed, this new land was little less than an earthly paradise. In beauty, in natural wealth, and in climate, I have never seen its like. The Transvaal is a fine country, but it is nothing to Kukuanaland. 
So soon as we started, Infadus had dispatched a runner to warn the people of the corral, which, by the way, was in his military command, of our arrival. This man had departed at an extraordinary speed, which Infadus informed me he would keep up all the way, as running was an exercise much practiced among his people. The result of this message now became apparent. When we arrived within two miles of the corral, we could see that company after company of men were issuing from its gates and marching towards us. Sir Henry laid his hand upon my arm and remarked that it looked as though we were going to meet with a warm reception. Something in his tone attracted Infadus's attention. "'Let not my lords be afraid,' he said hastily, "'for in my breast there dwells no guile. "'This regiment is one under my command "'and comes out by my orders to greet you.' "'I nodded easily, though I was not quite easy in my mind. "'About half a mile from the gates of this corral "'is a long stretch of rising ground "'sloping gently upward from the road, "'and here the companies formed. "'It was a splendid sight to see them, "'each company about three hundred strong, charging swiftly up the rise with flashing spears and waving plumes to take their appointed places. By the time we reached the slope, twelve such companies, or in all three thousand six hundred men, had passed out and taken up their positions along the road. Presently we came to the first company and were able to gaze in astonishment on the most magnificent set of warriors that I have ever seen. They were all men of mature age, mostly veterans of about forty, and not one of them was under six feet in height, whilst many stood six feet three or four. They wore upon their heads heavy black plumes of sacabula feathers, like those which adorned our guides. About their waists and beneath the right knees were bound circlets of white oxtails, while in their left hands they carried round shields measuring about Twenty inches across. These shields are very curious. The framework is made of an iron plate beaten out thin, over which is stretched milk-white oxhide. The weapons that each man bore were simple, but most effective, consisting of a short and very heavy two-edged spear with a wooden shaft, the blade being about six inches across at the widest part. These spears are not used for throwing, but, like the Zulu Banguan, or stabbing Asagai, are for close quarters only, when the wound inflicted by them is terrible. In addition to his Banguan, every man carried three large and heavy knives, each knife weighing about two pounds. One knife was fixed in the oxtail girdle, and the other two at the back of the round shield. These knives, which are called tolas by the Kukuanas, take the place of the throwing asagai of the Zulus. The Kukuana warriors can cast them with great accuracy to a distance of 50 yards, and it is their custom on charging to hurl a volley of them at the enemy as they come to close quarters. Each company remained still as a collection of bronze statues till we were opposite to it, when, at a signal given by its commanding officer, who, distinguished by a leopard-skin cloak, stood some paces in front, every spear was raised into the air, and from three hundred throats sprang forth with a sudden roar the royal salute of Kum. Then, so soon as we had passed, the company formed up behind us and followed us towards the corral, till at last the whole regiment of the greys, so called from their white shields, the cracked troops of the Kukuana people, was marching in our rear with a tread that shook the ground. At length, branching off from Solomon's great road, we came to the wide fosse surrounding the corral, which is at least a mile round, and fenced with a strong palisade of piles formed of the trunks of trees. At the gateway this fosse is spanned by a primitive drawbridge, which was let down by the guard to allow us to pass in. The corral is exceedingly well laid out. Through the center runs a wide pathway intersected at right angles by other pathways, so arranged as to cut the huts into square blocks, each block being the quarters of a company. 
the huts are dome-shaped and built like those of the Zulus of a framework of wattle, beautifully thatched with grass, but unlike the Zulu huts, they have doorways through which men could walk. Also they are much larger, and surrounded by a veranda about six feet wide, beautifully paved with powdered lime trodden hard. All along each side of this wide pathway that pierces the corral were ranged hundreds of women brought out by curiosity to look at us. These women, for a native race, are exceedingly handsome. They are tall and graceful, and their figures are wonderfully fine. The hair, though short, is rather curly than woolly. The features are frequently aquiline, and the lips are not unpleasantly thick, as is the case among most African races. But what struck us most was their exceedingly quiet and dignified air. They were as well-bred in their way as the habitués of a fashionable drawing-room, and in this respect they differ from Zulu women and their cousins the Maasai, who inhabit the district beyond Zanzibar. Their curiosity had brought them out to see us, but they allowed no rude expressions of astonishment or savage criticism to pass their lips as we trudged wearily in front of them. Not even when old Infadus, with a surreptitious motion of the hand, pointed out the crowning wonder of poor Good's beautiful white legs, did they suffer the feeling of intense admiration which evidently mastered their minds to find expression. They fixed their dark eyes upon this new and snowy loveliness, for, as I think I have said, Good's skin is exceedingly white, and that was all, but it was quite enough for Good, who is modest by nature. When we reached the center of the corral, Infadus halted at the door of a large hut, which was surrounded at a distance by a circle of smaller ones. Enter, sons of the stars, he said in a magniloquent voice, and deign to rest a while in our humble habitations. A little food shall be brought to you, so that ye may have no need to draw your belts tight from hunger. Some honey and some milk and an ox or two, and a few sheep. Not much, my lords, but still a little food. It is good, said I. In Fadus, we are weary with traveling through realms of air. Now let us rest. Accordingly, we entered the hut, which we found amply prepared for our comfort. Couches of tanned skins were spread for us to lie on, and water was placed for us to wash in. Presently we heard a shouting outside, and stepping to the door saw a line of damsels bearing milk and roasted mealies and honey in a pot. Behind these were some youths driving a fat young ox. We received the gifts, and then one of the young men drew the knife from his girdle and dexterously cut the ox's throat. In ten minutes it was dead, skinned, and jointed. The best of the meat was then cut off for us, and the rest, in the name of our party, I presented to the warriors round us, who took it and distributed the white lord's gift. Umbopa set to work, with the assistance of an extremely prepossessing young woman, to boil our portion in a large earthenware pot over a fire which was built outside the hut. And when it was nearly ready, we sent a message to Infadus and asked him and Scraga, the king's son, to join us. Presently they came, and sitting down upon little stools, of which there were several about the hut, for the Kukuanas do not, in general, squat upon their haunches like the Zulus, they helped us to get through our dinner. The old gentleman was most affable and polite, but it struck me that the young one regarded us with doubt. Together with the rest of the party, he had been overawed by our white appearance and our magic properties, but it seemed to me that, on discovering that we ate, drank, and slept like other mortals, his awe was beginning to wear off, and to be replaced by a sullen suspicion, which made me feel rather uncomfortable. In the course of our meal, Sir Henry suggested to me that it might be well to try to discover if our hosts knew anything of his brother's fate, or if they had ever seen or heard of him. But on the whole, I thought it would be wiser to say nothing of the matter at this time, 
it was difficult to explain a relative lost from the stars. After supper, we produced our pipes and lit them, a proceeding which filled Infadus and Scraga with astonishment. The Cucuanas were evidently unacquainted with the divine delights of tobacco smoke. The herb is grown among them extensively, but like the Zulus, they use it for snuff only, and quite fail to identify it in its new form. Presently I asked Infadus when we were to proceed on our journey, and was delighted to learn that preparations had been made for us to leave on the following morning messengers having already departed to inform Twala the king of our coming. It appeared that Twala was at his principal place, known as Lu, making ready for the great annual feast which was to be held in the first week of June. At this gathering all the regiments, with the exception of certain detachments left behind for garrison purposes, are brought up and paraded before the king, and the great annual witch hunt, of which more by and by, is held. We were to start at dawn, and Infadus, who was to accompany us, expected that we should reach Lu on the night of the second day, unless we were detained by accident or by swollen rivers. When they had given us this information, our visitors bade us good night, and having arranged to watch turn turn about, three of us flung ourselves down and slept the sweet sleep of the weary, whilst the fourth sat up on the lookout for possible treachery. End of chapter 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 9 Twala the King It will not be necessary for me to detail at length the incidents of our journey to Loo. It took two full days traveling along Solomon's great road, which pursued its even course right into the heart of Kukuana land. Suffice it to say that as we went, the country seemed to grow richer and richer, and the corrals, with their wide surrounding belts of cultivation, more and more numerous. They were all built upon the same principles as the first camp which we had reached, and were guarded by ample garrisons of troops. Indeed, in Kukuana land, as among the Germans, the Zulus, and the Maasai, every able-bodied man is a soldier so that the whole force of the nation is available for its wars, offensive or defensive. As we traveled, we were overtaken by thousands of warriors hurrying up to Lou to be present at the great annual review and festival, and more splendid troops I never saw. At sunset, on the second day, we stopped to rest a while upon the summit of some heights over which the road ran and there on a beautiful and fertile plain before us lay Lu itself. For a native town, it is an enormous place, quite five miles round, I should say, with outlying corrals projecting from it that serve on grand occasions as cantonments for the regiments, and a curious horseshoe-shaped hill with which we were destined to become better acquainted about two miles to the north. It is beautifully situated, and through the center of the corral, dividing it into two portions, runs a river, which appeared to be bridged in several places, the same indeed that we had seen from the slopes of Sheba's breasts. Sixty or seventy miles away, three great snow-capped mountains, placed at the points of a triangle, started out of the level plain. The conformation of these mountains is unlike that of Sheba's breasts, being sheer and precipitous instead of smooth and rounded. Infadus saw us looking at them and volunteered a remark. The road ends there, he said, pointing to the mountains, known among the Cucuanas as the Three Witches. Why does it end? I asked. Who knows, he answered with a shrug. The mountains are full of caves, and there is a great pit between them. It is there that the wise men of old time used to go 
to get whatever it was they came for to this country, and it is there now that our kings are buried in the place of death. What was it they came for? I ask eagerly. Nay, I know not. My lords who have dropped from the stars should know, he answered with a quick look. Evidently he knew more than he chose to say. Yes, I went on, you are right. In the stars we learn many things. I have heard, for instance, that the wise men of old came to these mountains to find bright stones, pretty playthings, and yellow iron. My lord is wise, he answered coldly. I am but a child and cannot talk with my lord on such matters. My lord must speak with Gagool the old at the king's place, who is wise even as my lord. And he went away. So soon as he was gone, I turned to the others and pointed out the mountains. There are Solomon's diamond mines, I said. Umbopa was standing with them, apparently plunged in one of the fits of abstraction which were common to him, and caught my words. Yes, Makumazan, he put in, in Zulu. The diamonds are surely there, and you shall have them, since you white men are so fond of toys and money. How dost that know that, Umbopa? I asked sharply, for I did not like his mysterious ways. He laughed. I dreamed it in the night, white men. Then he too turned on his heel and went. Now what, said Sir Henry, is our black friend driving at? He knows more than he chooses to say, that is clear. By the way, Quartermain, has he heard anything of, of my brother? Nothing. He has asked everyone he has become friendly with but they all declare that no white man has ever been seen in the country before. Do you suppose that he got here at all? suggested Good. We have only reached the place by a miracle. Is it likely he could have reached it without the map? I don't know, said Sir Henry gloomily, but somehow I think that I shall find him. Slowly the sun sank, then suddenly darkness rushed down on the land like a tangible thing. There was no breathing space between the day and night, no soft transformation scene, for in these latitudes twilight does not exist. The change from day to night is as quick and as absolute as the change from life to death. The sun sank and the world was wreathed in shadows. But not for long, for, see in the west there is a glow, then come rays of silver light, and at last the full and glorious moon lights up the plain, and shoots its gleaming arrows far and wide, filling the earth with a faint refulgence. We stood and watched the lovely sight, whilst the stars grew pale before this chastened majesty, and felt our hearts lifted up in the presence of a beauty that I cannot describe. Mine has been a rough life, but there are a few things I am thankful to have lived for, and one of them is to have seen that moon shine over Kukuanaland. Presently our meditations were broken in upon by our polite friend Infadus. If my lords are rested, we will journey on to Lu where a hut is made ready for my lords to-night. The moon is now bright, so that we shall not fall by the way. We assented, and in an hour's time were at the outskirts of the town, of which the extent, mapped out as it was by thousands of campfires, appeared absolutely endless. Indeed, Good, who is always fond of a bad joke, christened it Unlimited Lou. Soon we came to a moat with a drawbridge where we were met by the, the rattling of arms and the horse challenge of a sentry. Infadus gave some password that I could not catch, which was met with a salute, and we passed on through the central street of the great grass city. After nearly half an hour's tramp past endless lines of huts, Infadus halted at last by the gate of a little group of huts 
which surrounded a small courtyard of powdered limestone, and informed us that these were to be our poor quarters. We entered and found that a hut had been assigned to each of us. These huts were superior to any that we had yet seen, and in each was a most comfortable bed made of tanned skins, spread upon mattresses of aromatic grass. Food, too, was ready for us, and so soon as we had washed ourselves with water, which stood ready in earthenware jars, some young women of handsome appearance brought us roasted meats and mealy cobs daintily served on wooden platters, and presented them to us with deep obeisances. We ate and drank, and then, the beds having been all moved into one hut by our request, a precaution at which the amiable young ladies smiled, we flung ourselves down to sleep, thoroughly wearied with our long journey. When we woke, it was to find the sun high in the heavens, and the female attendants, who did not seem to be troubled by any false shame, already standing inside the hut, having been ordered to attend and help us to make ready. Make ready, indeed, growled Good. When one has only a flannel shirt and a pair of trousers, that does not take long. I wish you would ask them for my trousers, Quatermain. I asked accordingly, but was informed that these sacred relics had already been taken to the king, who would see us in the forenoon. Somewhat to their astonishment and disappointment, having requested the young ladies to step outside, we proceeded to make the best toilet of which the circumstances admitted. Good even went the length of again shaving the right side of his face. The left, on which now appeared a very fair crop of whiskers, we impressed upon him he must on no account touch. As for ourselves, we were content with a good wash and combing our hair. Sir Henry's yellow locks were now almost upon his shoulders, and he looked more like an ancient Dane than ever, while my grizzled scrub was fully an inch long instead of half an inch, which is the general way I considered my maximum length. By the time that we had eaten our breakfast and smoked a pipe, a message was brought to us by no less a personage than Infadus himself that Twala the king was ready to see us if we would be pleased to come. We remarked in reply that we should prefer to wait till the sun was a little higher. We were yet weary with our journey, etc., etc. It is always well, when dealing with uncivilized people, not to be in too great a hurry. They are apt to mistake politeness for awe or servility. So, although we were quite as anxious to see Twala as Twala could be to see us, we sat down and waited for an hour, employing the interval in preparing such presents as our slender stock of goods permitted, namely, the Winchester rifle, which had been used by poor Ventvogel, and some beads. The rifle and ammunition we determined to present to His Royal Highness, and the beads were for his wives and courtiers. We had already given a few to Infadus and Skraga, and found that they were delighted with them, never having seen such things before. At length we declared that we were ready, and guided by Infadus, started off to the audience, Umbopa carrying the rifle and beads. After walking a few hundred yards, we came to an enclosure, something like that surrounding the huts which had been allotted to us only fifty times as big, for it could not have covered less than six or seven acres of ground. All round the outside fence stood a row of huts which were the habitations of the king's wives. Exactly opposite the gateway, on the further side of the open space, was a very large hut built by itself in which his majesty resided. All the rest was open ground, that is to say, it would have been open had it not been filled by company after company of warriors, who were mustered there to the number of seven or eight thousand. These men stood still as statues as we advanced through them, 
and it would be impossible to give an adequate idea of the grandeur of the spectacle which they presented, with their waving plumes, their glancing spears, and iron-backed ox-hide shields. The space in front of the large hut was empty, but before it were placed several stools. On three of these, at a sign from Infadus, we seated ourselves, Umbopa standing behind us. As for Infadus, he took up a position by the door of the hut. So we waited for ten minutes or more in the midst of a dead silence, but conscious that we were the object of the concentrated gaze of some eight thousand pairs of eyes. It was a somewhat trying ordeal, but we carried it off as best we could. At length the door of the hut opened, and a gigantic figure, with a splendid tiger-skin carass flung over its shoulders, stepped out, followed by the boy Scraga, and what appeared to us to be a withered-up monkey wrapped in a fur cloak. The figure seated itself upon a stool. Scraga took his stand behind it, and the withered-up monkey crept on all fours into the shade of the hut and squatted down. Still there was silence. Then the gigantic figure slipped off the carass and stood up before us, a truly alarming spectacle. It was that of an enormous man, with the most entirely repulsive countenance we had ever beheld. This man's lips were as thick as a negro's. The nose was flat. He had but one gleaming black eye, for the other was represented by a hollow in the face, and his whole expression was cruel and sensual to a degree. From the large head rose a magnificent plume of white ostrich feathers. His body was clad in a shirt of shining chain armor, whilst round the waist and right knee were the usual garnishes of white oxtail. In his right hand was a huge spear, about the neck a thick torque of gold, and bound on the forehead shone dully a single and enormous uncut diamond. Still there was silence, but not for long. Presently the man, whom we rightly guessed to be the king, raised the great javelin in his hand. Instantly eight thousand spears were lifted in answer, and from eight thousand throats rang out the royal salute of Kum. Three times this was repeated, and each time the earth shook with the noise that can only be compared to the deepest notes of thunder. Be humble, O people, piped out a thin voice, which seemed to come from the monkey in the shade. It is the king. It is the king, boomed out the eight thousand throats in answer. Be humble, O people, it is the king. Then there was a silence again, dead silence. Presently, however, it was broken. A soldier on our left dropped his shield, which fell with a clatter onto the limestone flooring. Twala turned his one cold eye in the direction of the noise. "'Come hither, thou,' he said in a cold voice. A fine young man stepped out of the ranks and stood before him. "'It was thy shield that fell, thou awkward dog. "'Wilt thou make me a reproach in the eyes of these strangers from the stars? "'What hast thou to say for thyself?' We saw the poor fellow turn pale under his dusty skin. It was by chance, O calf of the black cow, he murmured. Then it is a chance for which thou must pay. Thou hast made me foolish. Prepare for death. I am the king's ox, was the low answer. Scraga, roared the king, let me see how thou canst use thy spear. Kill me, this blundering fool. Scraga stepped forward with an ill-favored grin and lifted his spear. The poor victim covered his eyes with his hand and stood still. As for us, we were petrified with horror. Once, twice, he waved the spear and then struck. Ah, right home. 
the spear stood out a foot behind the soldier's back. He flung up his hands and dropped dead. From the multitude about us rose something like a murmur. It rolled round and round and died away. The tragedy was finished. There lay the corpse, and we had not yet realized that it had been enacted. Sir Henry sprang up and swore a great oath, then, overpowered by the sense of silence, sat down again. "'The thrust was a good one,' said the king. "'Take him away.' Four men stepped out of the ranks, and lifting the body of the murdered man, carried it thence. "'Cover up the blood stains. Cover them up,' piped out the thin voice that proceeded from the monkey-like figure. "'The king's word is spoken. The king's doom is done.' Thereupon a girl came forward from behind the hut, bearing a jar filled with powdered lime, which she scattered over the red mark, blotting it from sight. Sir Henry, meanwhile, was boiling with rage at what had happened. Indeed, it was with difficulty that we could keep him still. "'Sit down, for heaven's sake,' I whispered. "'Our lives depend on it.' He yielded and remained quiet. Twala sat silent until the traces of the tragedy had been removed. Then he addressed us. "'White people,' he said, "'who come hither, whence I know not, and why I know not, greeting.' "'Greeting, Twala, king of the Kukuanas,' I answered. "'White people, whence come ye, and what seek ye?' "'We come from the stars.' Ask us not how. We come to see this land. Ye journey from far to see a little thing. And that man with you, pointing to Umbopa, does he also come from the stars? Even so, there are people of thy color in the heavens above. But ask not of matters too high for thee, Twala the king. Ye speak with a loud voice, people of the stars, Twala answered in a tone which I scarcely liked. Remember that the stars are far off, and ye are here. How if I make you as him whom they bore away? I laughed out loud, though there was little laughter in my heart. O king, I said, be careful, walk warily over hot stones, lest thou shouldst burn thy feet. Hold the spear by the handle, lest thou should cut thy hands. Touch but one hair of our heads, and destruction shall come upon thee. What, have not these, pointing to Enfadus and Scraga, who, young villain that he was, was employed in cleaning the blood of the soldier off his spear. Told thee what manner of men we are, hast thou seen the like of us? And I pointed to good feeling quite sure that he had never seen anybody before who looked in the least like him, as he then appeared. "'It is true I have not,' said the king, surveying good with interest. "'Have they not told thee how we strike with death from afar?' I went on. "'They have told me, but I believe them not. Let me see you kill. Kill me a man among those who stand yonder.' and he pointed to the opposite side of the corral, and I will believe. Nay, I answered, we shed no blood of men except in just punishment. But if thou wilt see, bid thy servants drive in an ox through the corral gates, and before he has run twenty paces I will strike him dead. Nay, laughed the king, kill me a man, and I will believe. "'Good, O king, so be it,' I answered coolly. "'Do thou walk across the open space, "'and before thy feet reach the gate thou shalt be dead. "'Or if thou wilt not, send thy son Scraga, "'whom at the moment it would have given me much pleasure to shoot.' "'On hearing this suggestion, Scraga uttered a sort of howl "'and bolted into the hut. "'Twala frowned majestically. "'The suggestion did not please him.' "'Let a young ox be driven in,' he said. Two men at once departed, running swiftly. "'Now, Sir Henry,' said I, "'do you shoot. "'I want to show this ruffian "'that I am not the only magician of the party.' 
Sir Henry accordingly took his express and made ready. I hope I shall make a good shot, he groaned. You must, I answered. If you miss with the first barrel, let him have the second. Sight for a hundred and fifty yards, and wait till the beast turns broadside on. Then came a pause, until presently we caught sight of an ox running straight for the corral gate. It came on through the gate, then catching sight of the vast concourse of people stopped stupidly, turned round and bellowed. "'Now's your time,' I whispered. Up went the rifle. Bang! Thud, and the ox was kicking on his back, shot in the ribs. The semi-hollow bullet had done its work well, and a sigh of astonishment went up from the assembled thousands. I turned round coolly. "'Have I lied, O king?' "'Nay, white man, it is the truth,' was the somewhat awed answer. "'Listen, Twala,' I went on, "'thou hast seen. "'Now know we come in peace, not in war. "'See,' and I held up the Winchester repeater, "'here is a hollow staff that shall enable thee to kill, "'even as we kill. "'Only I lay this charm upon it. "'Thou shalt kill no man with it. "'If thou liftest it against a man,' It shall kill thee. Stay, I will show thee. Bid a soldier step forty paces and place the shaft of a spear in the ground so that the flat blade looks towards us. In a few seconds it was done. Now, see, I will break yonder spear. Taking a careful sight, I fired. The bullet struck the flat of the spear and shattered the blade into fragments. Again the sigh of astonishment went up. Now, Twala, we give this magic tube to thee, and by and by I will show thee how to use it. But beware how thou turnest the magic of the stars against a man of earth. And I handed him the rifle. The king took it very gingerly and laid it down at his feet. As he did so, I observed the wizened, monkey-like figure creeping from the shadow of the hut. It crept on all fours, but when it reached the place where the king sat, it rose upon its feet, and throwing the furry covering from its face revealed a most extraordinary and weird countenance. Apparently it was that of a woman of great age, so shrunken that in size it seemed no larger than the face of a year-old child although made up of a number of deep and yellow wrinkles. Set in these wrinkles was a sunken slit that represented the mouth, beneath which the chin curved outwards to a point. There was no nose to speak of. Indeed, the visage might have been taken for that of a sun-dried corpse, had it not been for a pair of large black eyes, still full of fire and intelligence, which gleamed and played under the snow-white eyebrows and the projecting parchment-colored skull, like jewels in a charnel house. As for the head itself, it was perfectly bare and yellow in hue, while its wrinkled scalp moved and contracted like the hood of a cobra. The figure to which this fearful countenance belonged, a countenance so fearful indeed that it caused a shiver of fear to pass through us as we gazed at it, stood still for a moment. Then suddenly it projected a skinny claw armed with nails nearly an inch long, and laying it on the shoulder of Twala the king, began to speak in a thin and piercing voice. Listen, O king, listen, O warriors, listen, O mountains and plains and rivers, home of the Kukuana race, listen, O skies and sun, O rain and storm and mist, listen, O men and women, O youths and maidens, and O ye babes unborn, listen, all things that live and must die. Listen, all dead things that shall live again, again to die. Listen, the spirit of life is in me, and I prophesy, I prophesy, I prophesy. The words died away in a faint wail, and dread seemed to seize upon the hearts of all who heard them, including our own. This old woman was very terrible. Blood, 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 rivers of blood, blood everywhere. I see it, I smell it, I taste it. 
It is salt. It runs red upon the ground. It rains down from the skies. Footsteps, footsteps, footsteps. The tread of the white man coming from afar. It shakes the earth. The earth trembles before her master. Blood is good. The red blood is bright. There is no smell like the smell of new-shed blood. The lions shall lap it and roar. The vultures shall wash their wings in it and shriek with joy. I am old. I am old. I have seen much blood. <laughs> but I shall see more ere I die and be merry. How old am I, think ye? Your fathers knew me, and their fathers knew me, and their fathers' fathers' fathers. I have seen the white man and know his desires. I am old, but the mountains are older than I. Who made the great road, tell me? Who wrote the pictures on the rocks, tell me? Who reared up the three silent ones yonder that gaze across the pit, tell me? And she pointed towards the three precipitous mountains which we had noticed on the previous night. Ye know not, but I know. It was a white people who were here before ye are. Who shall be here when ye are not? Who shall eat you up and destroy you? Yea, yea, yea. And what came they for, the white ones, the terrible ones, the skilled in magic and all learning, the strong, the unswerving? What is that bright stone upon thy forehead, O king? Whose hands made the iron garment upon thy breast, O king? Ye know not, but I know, I the old one, I the wise one. I, the Isanusi, the witch doctress. Then she turned her bald vulture head towards us. What seek ye, white man of the stars? Ah, yes, of the stars. Do ye seek a lost one? Ye shall not find him here. He is not here. Never for ages upon ages has a white foot pressed this land. Never except once. "'and I remember that he left it but to die. "'Ye come for bright stones, I know it, I know it. "'Ye shall find them when the blood is dry, "'but ye shall return whence ye came, "'or shall ye stop with me? <laughs> "'And thou, thou with the dark skin and the proud bearing,' "'and she pointed her skinny finger at Umbopa, "'Who art thou, and what seekest thou?' Not stones that shine, not yellow metal that gleams, these thou leavest to white men from the stars. Methinks I know thee. Methinks I can smell the smell of the blood in thy heart. Strip off thy girdle. Here the features of this extraordinary creature became convulsed, and she fell to the ground, foaming in an epileptic fit, and was carried into the hut. The king rose up trembling and waved his hand. Instantly the regiments began to file off, and in ten minutes, save for ourselves, the king, and a few attendants, the great space was left empty. White people, he said, it passes in my mind to kill you. Gagool has spoken strange words, what say ye? I laughed. Be careful, O king, we are not easy to slay. Thou hast seen the fate of the ox. Wouldst thou be as the ox is? The king frowned. It is not well to threaten the king. We threaten not. We speak what is true. Try to kill us, O king, and learn. The great savage put his hand to his forehead and thought. Go in peace, he said at length. Tonight is the great dance. Ye shall see it. Fear not that I shall set a snare for you. Tomorrow I will think. It is well, O king, I answered unconcernedly, and then, accompanied by Infadus, we rose and went back to our corral. End of chapter 9 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 10 The Witch Hunt On reaching our tent, I motioned to Infadus to enter with us. Now, Infadus, I said, we would speak with thee. But my lord, say on. It seems to us, Infadus, that Twala the king is a cruel man. It is so, my lords. Alas, the land cries out because of his cruelties. Tonight you shall see. It is the great witch hunt, and many will be smelt out as wizards and slain. No man's life is safe. If the king covets a man's cattle or a man's wife, or if he fears a man that he should excite a rebellion against him, then Gagool, whom he saw, or some of the witch-finding women whom she has taught, will smell that man out as a wizard, and he will be killed. Many must die before the moon grows pale tonight. It is ever so. Perhaps I too shall be killed. As yet I have been spared because I am skilled in war, and am beloved by the soldiers, but I know not how long I have to live. The land groans at the cruelties of Twala the king. It is wearied of him and his red ways. Then why is it, Enfadus, that the people do not cast him down? Nay, my lords, he is the king, and if he were killed, Scraga would reign in his place, and the heart of Scraga is blacker than the heart of Twala his father. If Scraga were king, his yoke upon our neck would be heavier than the yoke of Twala. If Imotu had never been slain, or if Ignosi his son had lived, it might have been otherwise. But they are both dead. How knowest thou that Ignosi is dead? said a voice behind us. We looked round astonished to see who spoke. It was Umbopa. What meanest thou, boy? asked Infadus. Who told thee to speak? Listen, Infadus, was the answer, and I will tell thee a story. Years ago the king Imotu was killed in this country, and his wife fled with the boy Ignosi. Is it not so? It is so. It was said that the woman and her son died upon the mountains. Is it not so? It is even so. Well, it came to pass that the mother and the boy Ignosi did not die, they crossed the mountains and were led by a tribe of wandering desert men across the sands beyond, till at last they came to water and grass and trees again. How knowest thou this? Listen, they traveled on and on, many months' journey, till they reached a land where a people called the Amazulu, who are also of the Kukuana stock, lived by war and with them they tarried many years, till at length the mother died. Then the son Ignosi became a wanderer again, and journeyed into a land of wonders where white people live, and for many more years he learned the wisdom of the white people. It is a pretty story, said Infadus incredulously. For years he lived there working as a servant and a soldier, but holding in his heart all that his mother had told him of his own place, and casting about in his mind to find how he might journey thither to see his people and his father's house before he died. For long years he lived and waited, and at last the time came, as it ever comes to him who can wait for it, and he met some white men who would seek this unknown land, and joined himself to them. The white men started and traveled on and on, seeking for one who was lost. They crossed the burning desert, they crossed the snow-clad mountains, and at last reached the land of the Kukuanas, and there they found thee, O Infadus. Surely thou art mad to talk thus, said the astonished old soldier. Thou thinkest so, see, I will show thee, O oh my uncle. 
I am Ignosi, rightful king of the Kukuanas. Then, with a single movement, Umbopa slipped off his muka, or girdle, and stood naked before us. Look, he said, what is this? And he pointed to the picture of a great snake, tattooed in blue, round his middle, its tail disappearing into its open mouth, just above where the thighs are set into the body. Infadus looked, his eyes starting nearly out of his head. Then he fell upon his knees. Coom, coom, he ejaculated. It is my brother's son. It is the king. Did I not tell thee so, my uncle? Rise, I am not yet the king. But with thy help, and with the help of these brave white men, who are my friends, I shall be. Yet the old witch Gagul was right. The land shall run with blood first, and hers shall run with it, if she has any, and can die. For she killed my father with her words, and drove my mother forth. And now, Infadus, choose now. Will thou put thy hands between my hands and be my man? Will thou share the dangers that lie before me? and help me to overthrow this tyrant and murderer, or will thou not choose thou? The old man put his hand to his head and thought. Then he rose, and advancing to where Umbopa, or rather Ignosi, stood, he knelt before him and took his hand. Ignosi, rightful king of the Kukuanas, I put my hand between thy hands, and am thy man till death. When thou wast a babe, I dandle thee upon my knees. Now shall my old arm strike for thee and freedom. It is well, Infadus. If I conquer, thou shalt be the greatest man in the kingdom after the king. If I fail, thou canst only die, and death is not far off from thee. Rise, my uncle. And ye, ye white men, will ye help me? What have I to offer you? The white stones. If I conquer and can find them, ye shall have as many as ye can carry hence. Will that suffice you? I translated this remark. Tell him, answered Sir Henry, that he mistakes an Englishman. Wealth is good and if it comes in our way, we will take it. But a gentleman does not sell himself for wealth. Still, speaking for myself, I say this. I have always liked Umbopa, and so far as lies in me, I will stand by him in this business. It will be very pleasant to me to try to square matters with that cruel devil Twala. What do you say, good, and you, Quartermain? Well said good to adopt the language of hyperbole in which all these people seem to indulge you can tell that a row is surely good and warms the cockles of the heart and that so far as i am concerned i am his boy my only stipulation is that he allows me to wear trousers i translated the substance of these answers it is well my friends said Ignosi, late Umbopa. And what sayest thou, Macumazan? Art thou also with me, old hunter, cleverer than a wounded buffalo? I thought a while and scratched my head. Umbopa, or Ignosi, I said, I don't like revolutions. I am a man of peace and a bit of a coward. Here Umbopa smiled. But on the other hand, I stick up for my friends, Ignosi. You have stuck to us and played the part of a man, and I will stick by you. But mind you, I am a traitor and have to make my living, so I accept your offer about those diamonds in case we should ever be in position to avail ourselves of it. Another thing, we came, as you know, to look for Inkubu, Sir Henry's lost brother. You must help us to find him. "'That I will do,' answered Ignosi. 
Stay, Infadus, by the sign of the snake about my metal, tell me the truth. Has any white man, to thy knowledge, set his foot within the land? None, O Ignosi. If any white man had been seen or heard of, wouldst thou have known? I should certainly have known. Thou hearest, Inkubu, said Ignosi to Sir Henry. He has not been here. Well, well, said Sir Henry with a sigh. There it is. I suppose that he never got so far. Poor fellow, poor fellow. So it has all been for nothing. God's will be done. Now for business, I put in, anxious to escape from a painful subject. It is very well to be a king by right divine, Ignosi, but how does thou propose to become a king indeed? Nay, I know not, Infadus. Hast thou a plan? Ignosi, son of the lightning, answered his uncle. Tonight is the great dance and witch hunt. Many shall be smelt out and perish, and in the hearts of many others there will be grief and anguish and fury against the King Twala. When the dance is over, then I will speak to some of the great chiefs, who in turn, if I can win them over, will speak to their regiments. I shall speak to the chiefs softly at first, and bring them to see that thou art indeed the king. And I think that by tomorrow's light thou shalt have twenty thousand spears at thy command. And now I must go and think, and hear, and make ready. After the dance is done, if I am yet alive, and we are all alive, I will meet thee here, and we can talk. At best there must be war. At this moment our conference was interrupted by the cry that messengers had come from the king. Advancing to the door of the hut, we ordered that they should be admitted, and presently three men entered, each bearing a shining shirt of chain armor and a magnificent battle axe. The gifts of my lord, the king, to the white men from the stars, said a herald who came with them. We thank the king, I answered. Withdraw. The men went, and we examined the armor with great interest. It was the most wonderful chain work that either of us had ever seen. A whole coat fell together so closely that it formed a mass of links, scarcely too big to be covered with both hands. "'Do you make these things in this country, in Fadus? I asked. "'They are very beautiful.' "'Nay, my lord, they came down to us from our forefathers. "'We know not who made them, and there are but few left.' "'Editor's Note. "'In the Sudan, swords and coats of mail are still worn by Arabs "'whose ancestors must have stripped them from the bodies of crusaders.' None but those of royal blood may be clad in them. They are magic coats through which no spear can pass, and those who wear them are well nigh safe in the battle. The king is well pleased, or much afraid, or he would not have sent these garments of steel. Clothe yourselves in them tonight, my lords. The remainder of that day we spent quietly, "'resting and talking over the situation, which was sufficiently exciting. "'At last the sun went down, the thousand watchfires glowed out, "'and through the darkness we heard the tramp of many feet "'and the clashing of hundreds of spears "'as the regiments passed to their appointed places "'to be ready for the great dance. "'Then the full moon shone out in splendor, "'and as we stood watching her rays, Infadus arrived, clad in his war dress, and accompanied by a guard of twenty men to escort us to the dance. As he recommended, we had already donned the shirts of chain armor which the king had sent us, putting them on under our ordinary clothing, and finding to our surprise that they were neither very heavy nor uncomfortable. These steel shirts, 
which evidently had been made for men of a very large stature, hung somewhat loosely upon Good and myself, but Sir Henry's fitted his magnificent frame like a glove. Then, strapping our revolvers round our waists, and taking in our hands the battle-axes which the king had sent with the armor, we started. On arriving at the great corral, where we had that morning been received by the king, we found that it was closely packed with some twenty thousand men arranged round it in regiments. These regiments were, in turn, divided into companies, and between each company ran a little path to allow space for the witch-finders to pass up and down. Anything more imposing than the sight that was presented by this vast and orderly concourse of armed men it is impossible to conceive. There they stood, perfectly silent, and the moon poured her light upon the forest of their raised spears, upon their majestic forms, waving plumes, and the harmonious shading of their various colored shields. Wherever we looked were line upon line of dim faces surrounded by range upon range of shimmering spears. Surely, I said to Enfadus, the whole army is here. Nay, Macumazan, he answered, but a third of it. One third is present at this dance each year. Another third is mustered outside in case there should be trouble when the killing begins. Ten thousand more garrison the outposts round Lou, and the rest watch at the corrals in the country. Thou seest it is a great people. They are very silent, said Good, and indeed the intense stillness among such a vast concourse of living men was almost overpowering. "'What says Buguan?' asked Infadus. "'I translated. "'Those over whom the shadow of death is hovering are silent,' he answered grimly. "'Will many be killed?' "'Very many.' "'It seems,' I said to the others, "'that we are going to assist at a gladiatorial show arranged regardless of expense.' Sir Henry shivered, and Good said that he wished we could get out of it. "'Tell me,' I asked Infadus, "'are we in danger?' "'I know not, my lords. I trust not. But do not seem afraid. If you live through the night, all may go well with you. The soldiers murmur against the king. All this while we had been advancing steadily towards the center of the open space, in the midst of which were placed some stools. As we proceeded, we perceived another small party coming from the direction of the royal hut. It is the king, Twala, Scraga, his son, and Gagul, the old. And see, with them are those who slay, said Infadus, pointing to a little group of about a dozen gigantic and savage-looking men, armed with spears in one hand, and heavy carries in the other. The king seated himself upon the center stool. Gagul crouched at his feet, and the other stood behind him. Greeting, white lords, Twala cried as we came up. Be seated, waste not precious time. The night is all too short for the deeds that must be done. Ye come in a good hour, and shall see a glorious show. Look round, white lords, look round. And he rolled his one wicked eye from regiment to regiment. Can the stars show you such a sight as this? See how they shake in their wickedness, all those who have evil in their hearts, and fear the judgment of heaven above. Begin, begin, piped Gagool in her thin, piercing voice. The hyenas are hungry. They howl for food. Begin, begin. For a moment there was intense stillness, made horrible by a presage of what was to come. The king lifted his spear, and suddenly twenty thousand feet were raised, as though they belonged to one man, and brought down with a stamp upon the earth. This was repeated three times. 
causing the solid ground to shake and tremble. Then from a far point of the circle a solitary voice began a wailing song, of which the refrain ran something as follows. What is the lot of man born of women? Back came the answer rolling out from every throat in that vast company. Death! Gradually, however, the song was taken up by company after company till the whole armed multitude were singing it, and I could no longer follow the words except in so far as they appeared to represent various phases of human passions, fears, and joys. Now it seemed to be a love song, now a majestic swelling war chant, and last of all a death dirge ending suddenly in one heart-breaking wail that went echo and rolling away in a volume of blood-curdling sound. Again silence fell upon the place, and again it was broken by the king lifting his hand. Instantly we heard a pattering of feet, and from out of the masses of warriors strange and awful figures appeared running towards us. As they drew near we saw that these were women, most of them aged, for their white hair, ornamented with small bladders taken from fish, streamed out behind them. Their faces were painted in stripes of white and yellow. Down their backs hung snake skins, and round their waists rattled circlets of human bones, while each held a small forked wand in her shriveled hand. In all there were ten of them. When they arrived in front of us, they halted, and one of them, pointing with her wand towards the crouching figure of Gagul, cried out, Mother! Old mother, we are here. Good, 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 answered that aged iniquity. Are your eyes keen, Isanusis, witch doctresses, ye seers in dark places? Mother, they are keen. Good, good, good. Are your ears open, Isanusis, ye who hear words that come not from the tongue? Mother, they are open. Good, good, good. Are your senses awake, Isanusis? Can ye smell blood? Can ye purge the land of the wicked ones who compass evil against the king and against their neighbors? Are ye ready to do justice of heaven above, ye whom I have taught, who have eaten of the bread of my wisdom and drunk of the water of my magic? Mother, we can. Then go, tarry not, ye vultures. See, the slayers, pointing to the ominous group of executioners behind. Make sharp their spears. The white men from afar are hungry to see. Go. With a wild yell, Gagool's horrid ministers broke away in every direction, like fragments from a shell, the dry bones round their waists rattling as they ran and headed for various points of the dense human circle. We could not watch them all, so we fixed our eyes upon the Isanusi nearest to us. When she came to within a few paces of the warriors, she halted and began to dance wildly, turning round and round with an almost incredible rapidity, and shrieking out sentences such as, I smell him, the evil doer. He is near, he who poisoned his mother. I hear the thoughts of him who thought evil of the king. Quicker and quicker she danced, till she lashed herself into such a frenzy of excitement that the foam flew in specks from her gnashing jaws, till her eyes seemed to start from her head and her flesh to quiver visibly. Suddenly she stopped dead and stiffened all over like a pointed dog when he scents game. And then, with outstretched wand, she began to creep stealthily towards the soldiers before her. It seemed to us that as she came, their stoicism gave way, and that they shrank from her. As for ourselves, we followed her movements with a horrible fascination. Presently, still creeping and crouching like a dog, the Isanusi was before them. 
Then she halted and pointed, and again crept on a pace or two. Suddenly the end came. With a shriek, she sprang in and touched a tall warrior with her forked wand. Instantly, two of his comrades, those standing immediately next to him, seized the doomed man, each by one arm, and advanced with him towards the king. He did not resist, but we saw that he dragged his limbs as though they were paralyzed, and that his fingers from which the spear had fallen were limp like those of a man newly dead. As he came, two of the villainous executioners stepped forward to meet him. Presently they met, and the executioners turned round, looking towards the king as though for orders. Kill, said the king. Kill, squeaked Gagool. Kill, re-echoed Scraga with a hollow chuckle. Almost before the words were uttered, the horrible deed was done. One man had driven his spear into the victim's heart, and to make assurance double sure, the other had dashed out his brains with a great club. One, counted Twala the king, just like a black Madame Defarge, as Good said, and the body was dragged a few paces away and stretched out. Hardly was the thing done before another poor wretch was brought up like an ox to the slaughter. This time we could see, from the leopard-skin cloak which he wore, that the man was the victim of rank. Again the awful syllables were spoken, and the victim fell. Two, counted the king. And so the deadly game went on, till about a hundred bodies were stretched in rows behind us. I have heard of the gladiatorial shows of the Caesars and of the Spanish bullfights, but I take the liberty of doubting if either of them could be half so horrible as this Cucuana witch hunt. Gladiatorial shows in Spanish bullfights, at any rate, contributed to the public amusement, which certainly was not the case here. The most confirmed sensation monger would fight shy of sensation if he knew that it was well on the cards that he would, in his own proper person, be the subject of the next event. Once we rose and tried to remonstrate, but were sternly repressed by Twala. Let the law take its course, white men. These dogs are magicians and evildoers. It is well that they should die, was the only answer vouchsafed to us. About half past ten there was a pause. The witch-finders gathered themselves together, apparently exhausted with their bloody work, and we thought that the performance was done with. But it was not so, for presently, to our surprise, the ancient woman, Gagool, rose from her crouching position, and supporting herself with a stick, staggered off into the open space. It was an extraordinary sight to see this frightful, vulture-headed old creature bent nearly double with extreme age, gather strength by degrees, until at last she rushed about almost as actively as her ill-omened pupils. To and fro she ran, chanting to herself, till suddenly she made a dash at a tall man standing in front of one of the regiments and touched him. As she did this, a sort of groan went up from the regiment, which evidently he commanded but two of its officers seized him all the same and brought him up for execution. We learned afterwards that he was a man of great wealth and importance, being indeed a cousin of the king. He was slain, and Twala counted one hundred and three. Then Gagool again sprang to and fro, gradually drawing nearer and nearer to ourselves. "'Hang me if I don't believe she is going to try her games on us,' ejaculated Good in horror. "'Nonsense,' said Sir Henry. "'As for myself, when I saw that old fiend dancing nearer and nearer, "'my heart positively sank into my boots. "'I glanced behind us at the long row of corpses and shivered. 
nearer and nearer waltzed Gagool, looking for all the world like an animated crooked stick or comma, her horrid eyes gleaming and glowing with a most unholy luster. Nearer she came, and yet nearer, every creature in that vast assemblage watching her movements with intense anxiety. At last she stood still and pointed. "'Which is it to be?' asked Sir Henry to himself. In a moment all doubts were at rest, for the old hag had rushed in and touched Umbopa, alias Ignosi, on the shoulder. "'I smell him out!' she shrieked. "'Kill him! Kill him! He is full of evils! Kill him! The stranger! Before blood flows from him! Slay him, O king!' There was a pause, of which I instantly took advantage. "'O king,' I called out, rising from my seat, "'this man is the servant of thy guests. "'He is their dog. "'Whosoever sheds the blood of our dog sheds our blood. "'By the sacred law of hospitality, I claim protection for him. "'Gagool, mother of the witch-finders, has smelt him out. "'He must die, white men,' was the sullen answer. "'Nay, he shall not die,' I replied. "'He who tries to touch him shall die indeed.' "'Seize him!' roared Twala to the executioners, "'who stood round red to the eyes with the blood of their victims. "'They advanced towards us and then hesitated. "'As for Ignosi, he clutched his spear "'and raised it as though determined to sell his life dearly.' "'Stand back, ye dogs!' I shouted. "'If you would see tomorrow's light, "'touch one hair of his head and your king dies.' "'And I covered Twala with my revolver. "'Sir Henry and Good also drew their pistols, "'Sir Henry pointing his at the leading executioner "'who was advancing to carry out the sentence, "'and Good taking a deliberate aim at Gagool.' Twala winced perceptibly as my barrel came in a line with his broad chest. "'Well,' I said, "'what is it to be, Twala?' Then he spoke. "'Put away your magic tubes,' he said. "'Ye have adjured me in the name of hospitality, "'and for that reason, but not from fear of what ye can do, "'I spare him. "'Go in peace.' "'It is well,' I answered unconcernedly. We are weary of slaughter and would sleep. Is the dance ahead? It is ended, Twala answered sulkily. Let these dead dogs, pointing to the long row of corpses, be flung out to the hyenas and the vultures. And he lifted his spear. Instantly the regiments began to defile through the corral gateway in perfect silence, a fatigue party only remaining behind to drag away the corpses of those who had been sacrificed. Then we rose also, and making our salam to his majesty, which he hardly deigned to acknowledge, we departed to our huts. Well, said Sir Henry as we sat down, having first lit a lamp of the sort used by the Cucuanas, of which the wick is made from the fiber of a species of palm leaf and the oil from clarified hippopotamus fat. Well, I feel uncommonly inclined to be sick. If I had any doubts about helping Umbopa to rebel against that infernal blackguard, put in good, they are gone now. It was as much as I could do to sit still while that slaughter was going on. I tried to keep my eyes shut, but they would open just at the wrong time. I wonder where Infadus is. Umbopa, my friend, you ought to be grateful to us. Your skin came near to having an air hole made in it. I am grateful, Bugwan, was Umbopa's answer when I had translated. And I shall not forget... As for Infadus, he will be here by and by. We must wait. So we lit our pipes and waited. End of chapter 10 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by L. Ryder Haggard Chapter 11 We Give a Sign for a long while, two hours, I should think, we sat there in silence, being too much overwhelmed by the recollection of the horrors we had seen to talk. At last, just as we were thinking of turning in, drew nigh to dawn, we heard a sound of steps. Then came the challenge of a sentry posted at the corral gate, which apparently was answered, though not in an audible tone, for the steps still advanced, and in another second Infadus had entered the hut, followed by some half-dozen stately-looking chiefs. "'My lords,' he said, "'I have come according to my word. "'My lords and Ignosi, rightful king of the Cucuanas, "'I have brought with me these men,' pointing to the row of chiefs, "'who are great men among us, having each one of them the command of three thousand soldiers that live but to do their bidding under the kings. I have told them of what I have seen and what my ears have heard. Now let them also behold the sacred snake around thee, and hear thy story, Ignosi, that they may say whether or not they will make cause with thee against Twala the king. By way of answer, Ignosi again stripped off his girdle, and exhibited the snake tattooed about him. Each chief in turn drew near and examined the sign by the dim light of the lamp, and without saying a word passed on to the other side. Then Ignosi resumed his muka, and addressing them, repeated the history he had detailed in the morning. "'Now ye have heard, chiefs,' said Infadus, when he had done. What say ye? Will ye stand by this man and help him to his father's throne? Or will ye not? The land cries out against Twala, and the blood of the people flows like the waters in spring. Ye have seen to-night. Two other chiefs there were with whom I had in my mind to speak, and where are they now? The hyenas howl over their corpses. Soon shall ye be as they are, if ye strike not. Choose, then, my brothers. The eldest of the six men, a short, thick-set warrior with white hair, stepped forward a pace and answered, Thy words are true, Infadus, the land cries out. My own brother is among those who died tonight. But this is a great matter, and the thing is hard to believe. How know we that if we lift our spears, it may not be for a thief and a liar? It is a great matter, I say, of which none can see the end. For of this be sure, blood will flow in rivers before the deed is done. Many will still cleave to the king, for men worship the sun that still shines bright in the heavens rather than that which has not risen. These white men from the stars, their magic is great, and Ignosi is under the cover of their wing. If he be indeed the rightful king, let them give us a sign, and let the people have a sign, that all may see. So shall men cleave to us, knowing of a truth that the white man's magic is with them. Ye have the sign of the snake, I answered. My lord, it is not enough. The snake may have been placed there since the man's childhood. Show us a sign, and it will suffice, but we will not move without a sign. The others gave a decided assent, and I turned in perplexity to Sir Henry and Good, and explained the situation. I think I have it, said Good exultingly. Ask them to give us a moment to think. I did so, and the chiefs withdrew. 
So soon as they had gone, Good went to the little box where he kept his medicines, unlocked it, and took out a notebook, in the fly leaves of which was an almanac. Now look here, you fellows. Isn't tomorrow the fourth of June? he answered. We had kept a careful note of the days, so were able to answer that it was. Very good. Then here we have it. Four June. Total eclipse of the moon commences at 8.15 Greenwich time. Visible in Tenerife, South Africa, etc. There's a sign for you. Tell them we will darken the moon tomorrow night. The idea was a splendid one. Indeed, the only weak spot about it was a fear lest Good's almanac might be incorrect. If we made a false prophecy on such a subject, our prestige would be gone forever, and so would Ignosi's chance of the throne of the Cucuanas. Suppose that the almanac is wrong, suggested Sir Henry to Good, who was busily employed in working out something on a blank page of the book. I see no reason to suppose anything of the sort, was his answer. Eclipses always come up to time, at least that is my experience of them, and it especially states that this one will be visible in South Africa. I have worked out the reckonings as well as I can without knowing our exact position, and I make out that the eclipse should begin here about 10 o'clock tomorrow night, and last till half past 12. For an hour and a half or so, there should be almost total darkness. Well, said Sir Henry, I suppose we had better risk it. I acquiesced, though doubtfully, for eclipses are queer cattle to deal with. It might be a cloudy night, for instance, or our dates might be wrong, and sent Umbopa to summon the chiefs back. Presently they came, and I addressed them thus. Great men of the Kukuanas, and thou, Infadus, listen. We love not to show our powers, for to do so is to interfere with the course of nature and to plunge the world into fear and confusion. But since this matter is a great one, and as we are angered against the king because of the slaughter we have seen and because of the act of the Isanusi, Gagul, who would have put our friend Ignosi to death, we have determined to break a rule and to give such a sign as all men may see. Come hither. And I led them to the door of the hut and pointed to the red ball of the moon. What see ye there? We see the sinking moon, answered the spokesman of the party. It is so. Now tell me, can any mortal man put out that moon before her hour of setting? and bring the curtain of black light down upon the land. The chief laughed a little at the question. No, my lord, that no man can do. The moon is stronger than man who looks on her, nor can she vary in her course. Ye say so. Yet I tell you that tomorrow night, about two hours before midnight, we will cause the moon to be eaten up, for a space of an hour and half an hour. Yes, deep darkness shall cover the earth, and it shall be for a sign that Ignosi is indeed king of the Cucuanas. If we do this thing, will ye be satisfied? Yea, my lords, answered the old chief with a smile, which was reflected on the faces of his companions. If ye do this thing, we will be satisfied indeed. It shall be done. We three, Inkibu, Buguan, and Makumazan have said it, and it shall be done. Dost thou hear, Enfadus? I hear, my lord, but it is a wonderful thing that ye promise to put out the moon, the mother of the world, when she is at her full. Yet shall we do it, Infadus. It is well, my lords. Today, two hours after sunset, Twala will send for my lords to witness the girls' dance, 
and one hour after the dance begins, the girl whom Twala thinks the fairest shall be killed by Scraga, the king's son, as a sacrifice to the silent ones who sit and keep watch by the mountains yonder. And he pointed towards the three strange-looking peaks where Solomon's road was supposed to end. Then let my lords darken the moon and save the maiden's life, and the people will believe indeed. Aye, said the old chief, still smiling a little, the people will believe indeed. Two miles from Lu, went on in Fadus, there is a hill curved like a new moon, a stronghold, where my regiment and three other regiments which these chiefs command are stationed. This morning we will make a plan whereby two or three other regiments may be moved there also. Then, if in truth my lords can darken the moon, in the darkness I will take my lords by the hand and lead them out of loo to this place where they shall be safe, and thence we can make war upon Twala the king. It is good, said I. Let leave us to sleep a while and to make ready our magic. Infadus rose, and having saluted us, departed with the chiefs. My friends, said Ignosi, as soon as they were gone, can ye do this wonderful thing, or were ye speaking empty words to the captains? We believe that we can do it, Umbopa, Ignosi, I mean. It is strange, he answered, and had ye not been Englishmen, I would not have believed it. But I have learned that English gentlemen tell no lies. If we live through the matter, be sure that I will repay you. Ignosi, said Sir Henry, promise me one thing. I will promise, Inkubu, my friend, even before I hear it, answered the big man with a smile. What is it? This, that if ever you come to be king of this people, you will do away with the smelling out of wizards such as we saw last night, and that the killing of men without trial shall no longer take place in the land. Ignosi thought for a moment after I had translated this request, and then answered, The ways of black people are not as the ways of white men, Inkibu, nor do we value life so highly. Yet I will promise. If it be in my power to hold them back, the witch-finders shall hunt no more, nor shall any man die the death without trial or judgment. "'That's a bargain, then,' said Sir Henry. "'And now let us get a little rest.' "'Thoroughly wearied out, we were soon sound asleep, "'and slept till Ignosi woke us about eleven o'clock. "'Then we rose, washed, and ate a hearty breakfast. "'After that we went outside the hut and walked about, "'amusing ourselves with examining the structure of the Kukuana huts, and observing the customs of the women. "'I hope that eclipse will come off,' said Sir Henry, presently. "'If it does not, it will soon be all up with us,' I answered mournfully. "'For so sure as we are living men, some of those chiefs will tell the whole story to the king, and then there will be another sort of eclipse, and one that we shall certainly not like.' Returning to the hut, we ate some dinner and passed the rest of the day in receiving visits of ceremony and curiosity. At length the sun set, and we enjoyed a couple of hours of such quiet as our melancholy forebodings would allow to us. Finally, about half past eight, a messenger came from Twala to bid us to the great annual dance of girls which was about to be celebrated. Hastily we put on the chain shirts that the king had sent us, and taking our rifles and ammunition with us, so as to have them handy in case we had to fly, as suggested by Infidus, we started boldly enough, though with inward fear and trembling. The great space in front of the king's corral bore a very different appearance from that which it had presented on the previous evening. In place of the grim ranks of serried warriors, were company after company of Kukuana girls, 
not overdressed, so far as clothing went, but each crowned with a wreath of flowers, and holding a palm leaf in one hand and a white arum lily in the other. In the center of the open moonlit space sat Twala the king, with old Gagool at his feet, attended by Infidus, the boy Scraga, and twelve guards. There were also present about a score of chiefs, among whom I recognized most of our friends of the night before. Twala greeted us with much apparent cordiality, though I saw him fix his one eye viciously on Umbopa. "'Welcome, white men from the stars,' he said. "'This is another sight from that which your eyes gazed on by the light of last night's moon, but it is not so good a sight. "'Girls are pleasant, and were it not for such as these,' and he pointed round him, "'we should none of us be here this day, but men are better. "'Kisses and the tender words of women are sweet, "'but the sound of the clashing of the spears of warriors,' and the smell of men's blood are sweeter far. Would ye have wives from among our people, white men? If so, choose the fairest here, and ye shall have them, as many as ye will. And he paused for an answer. As the prospect did not seem to be without attractions for good, who, like most sailors, is of a susceptible nature, being elderly and wise, foreseeing the endless complications that anything of the sort would involve, for women bring trouble so surely as the night follows the day, I put in a hasty answer. Thanks to thee, O king. But we white men wed only with white women like ourselves. Your maidens are fair, but they are not for us. The king laughed. It is well. In our land there is a proverb which runs, Women's eyes are always bright, whatever the color. And another that says, Love her who is present, for be sure she who is absent is false to thee. But perhaps these things are not so in the stars. In a land where men are white, all good things are possible. So be it, white men. The girls will not go begging. Welcome again, and welcome too, thou black one. If Gagool here had won her way, thou wouldst have been stiff and cold by now. It is lucky for thee that thou too camest from the stars. Ha <laughs> ha! I can kill thee before thou killest me, O king, was Ignosi's calm answer, and thou shalt be stiff before my limbs cease to bend. Twala started. Thou speakest boldly, boy, he replied angrily. Presume not too far. He may well be bold in whose lips are truth. The truth is a sharp spear which flies home and misses not. It is a message from the stars, O king. Twala scowled, and his one eye gleamed fiercely, but he said nothing more. Let the dance begin, he cried and then the flower-crowned girls sprang forward in companies, singing a sweet song and waving the delicate palms and white lilies. On they danced, looking faint and spiritual in the soft, sad light of the risen moon, now whirling round and round, now meeting in mimic warfare, swaying, eddying here and there, coming forward, falling back in an ordered confusion delightful to witness. At last they paused, and a beautiful young woman sprang out of the ranks and began to pirouette in front of us with a grace and vigor which would have put most ballet girls to shame. At length she retired exhausted, and another took her place, then another, and another. But none of them, either in grace, skill, or personal attractions, came up to the first. When the chosen girls had all danced, the king lifted his hand. "'Which deem ye the fairest, white men?' he asked. "'The first, said I unthinkingly. Next second I regretted it, for I remembered that Infadus had told us that the fairest woman must be offered up as a sacrifice. 
then is my mind as your minds, and my eyes as your eyes. She is the fairest, and a sorry thing it is for her, for she must die. I must die, piped out Gagool, casting a glance of her quick eyes in the direction of the poor girl, who, as yet ignorant of the awful fate in store for her, was standing some ten yards off in front of a company of maidens, "'engaged in nervously picking a flower from her wreath to pieces, petal by petal. "'Why, O king,' said I, restraining my indignation with difficulty, "'the girl has danced well and pleased us. "'She is fair, too. "'It would be hard to reward her with death.' "'Twala laughed as he answered. "'It is our custom, and the figures who sit in the stone yonder,' and he pointed towards the three distant peaks, must have their due. Did I fail to put the fairest girl to death today, misfortune would fall upon me in my house. Thus runs the prophecy of my people. If the king offer not a sacrifice of a fair girl on the day of the dance of the maidens to the old ones who sit and watch on the mountains, then shall he fall, and his house. Look ye, white men, my brother who reigned before me offered not the sacrifice because of the tears of the woman, and he fell, and his house, and I reign in his stead. It is finished. She must die. Then turning to the guards, bring her hither, Scraga, make sharp thy spear. Two of the men stepped forward, and as they advanced, the girl, for the first time realizing her impending fate, screamed aloud and turned to fly. But the strong hands caught her fast and brought her, struggling and weeping, before us. "'What is thy name, girl?' piped Gagool. "'What? Wilt thou not answer? Shall the king's son do his work at once?' At this hint, Scraga, looking more evil than ever, advanced a step and lifted his great spear, and at that moment I saw Good's hand creep to his revolver. The poor girl caught the faint glint of steel through her tears, and it sobered her anguish. She ceased struggling and clasped her hands convulsively, stood shuddering from head to foot. See, cried Skaga, in a high glee, she shrinks from the sight of my little plaything even before she has tasted it. And he tapped the broad blade of his spear. If ever I get the chance, you shall pay for that, you young hound. I heard Good mutter beneath his breath. Now that thou art quiet, give us thy name, my dear. Come, speak out, and fear not, said Gagool in mockery. "'Oh, mother,' answered the girl in trembling accents, "'my name is Fulata of the house of Suko. "'Oh, mother, why must I die? I have done no wrong.' "'Be comforted,' went on the old woman in her hateful tone of mockery. "'Thou must die, indeed, as a sacrifice to the old ones who sit yonder.' "'And she pointed to the peaks.' "'But it is better to sleep in the night than to toil in the daytime. "'It is better to die than to live, "'and thou shalt die by the royal hand of the king's own son.' "'The girl Fulata wrung her hands in anguish and cried out aloud, "'O oh, cruel, and I so young, "'what have I done that I should never again see the sun rise out of the night, "'or the stars come following on his track in the evening?' that I may no more gather the flowers when the dew is heavy, or listen to the laughing of the waters. Woe is me that I shall never see my father's hut again, nor feel my mother's kiss, nor tend the lamb that is sick. Woe is me that no lover shall put his arm around me and look into my eyes, nor shall men children be born of me. Oh, cruel, cruel. And again she wrung her hands and turned her tear-stained, flower-crowned face to heaven, looking so lovely in her despair, for she was indeed a beautiful woman, that assuredly the sight of her would have melted the hearts of any less cruel 
than were the three fiends before us. Prince Arthur's appeal to the ruffians who came to blind him was not more touching than that of this savage girl. But it did not move Gagool or Gagool's master, though I saw signs of pity among the guards behind and on the faces of the chiefs. And as for good, he gave a fierce snort of indignation and made a quick motion as though to go to her assistance. With all a woman's quickness, the doomed girl interpreted what was passing in his mind, and by a sudden movement flung herself before him and clasped his beautiful white legs with her hands. "'O oh, white father from the stars,' she cried, "'throw over me the mantle of thy protection. Let me creep into the shadow of thy strength, that I may be saved.' Oh, keep me from these cruel men and from the mercies of Gagool. All right, my hearty, I'll look after you, sang out good and nervous Saxon. Come on, get up, there's a good girl, and he stooped and caught her hand. Twala turned and motioned to his son, who advanced with his spear lifted. Now's your time, whispered Sir Henry to me. What are you waiting for? I am waiting for that eclipse, I answered. I have had my eye on the moon for the last half hour, and I never saw it look healthier. Well, you must risk it now, or the girl will be killed. Twala is losing patience. Recognizing the force of the argument, and having cast one more despairing look at the bright face of the moon, for never did the most ardent astronomer with a theory to prove await a celestial event with such anxiety. I stepped with all the dignity that I could command between the prostrate girl and the advancing spear of Scraga. King, I said, it shall not be. We will not endure this thing. Let the girl go in safety. Twala rose from his seat in wrath and astonishment, and from the chiefs and serried ranks of maidens who had closed in slowly upon us in anticipation of the tragedy came a murmur of amazement. Shall not be, thou white dog, that yappest at the lion in his cave, shall not be, art thou mad? Be careful, lest this chicken's fate overtake thee, and those with thee. How canst thou save her or thyself? Who art thou that thou settest thyself between me and my will? Back, I say. Scraga, kill her. No, guards, seize these men. At his cry, armed men ran swiftly from behind the hut, where they had evidently been placed beforehand. Sir Henry, Good, and Umbopa ranged themselves alongside of me and lifted their rifles. Stop! I shouted boldly, though at the moment my heart was in my boots. Stop! We, the white men from the stars, say that it shall not be. Come but one pace nearer, and we will put out the moon like a wind-blown lamp, as we who dwell in her house can do, and plunge the land in darkness. Dare to disobey, and ye shall taste of our magic. My threat produced an effect. The man halted, and Scragga stood still before us, his spear lifted. Hear him! Hear him! piped Gagool. Hear the liar who says that he will put out the moon like a lamp. Let him do it, and the girl shall be speared. Yes, let him do it, or die by the girl, he and those with him. I glanced up at the moon despairingly, and now to my intense joy and relief saw that we, or rather the almanac, had made no mistake. On the edge of the great orb lay a faint rim of shadow, while a smoky hue grew and gathered upon its bright surface. Never shall I forget that supreme, that superb moment of relief. Then I lifted my hand solemnly towards the sky, an example which Sir Henry and Good followed, and quoted a line or two from the Ingoldsby legends at it in the most impressive tones that I could command. Sir Henry followed suit with a verse out of the Old Testament and something about Balbus building a wall in Latin 
whilst Good addressed the Queen of Night in a volume of the most classical bad language which he could think of. Slowly the penumbra, the shadow of a shadow, crept on over the bright surface, and as it crept I heard deep gasps of fear rising from the multitude around. Look, O king, I cried, look, Gagool, look, chiefs and people and women, and see if the white men from the stars keep their word, or if they be but empty liars. The moon grows black before your eyes. Soon there will be darkness, ay, darkness in the hour of the full moon. Ye have asked for a sign, it is given to you. Grow dark, O moon. Withdraw thy light, thou pure and holy one. Bring the proud heart of usurping murderers to the dust and eat up the world with shadows. A groan of terror burst from the onlookers. Some stood petrified with dread. Others threw themselves upon their knees and cried aloud. As for the king, he sat still and turned pale beneath his dusky skin. Only Gagool kept her courage. It will pass, she cried. I have often seen the like before. No man can put out the moon. Lose not heart. Sit still. The shadow will pass. Wait, and ye shall see, I replied, hopping with excitement. O oh, moon, 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 wherefore art thou so cold and fickle? This appropriate quotation was from the pages of a popular romance that I chanced to have read recently though now I come to think of it, it was ungrateful of me to abuse the Lady of the Heavens, who was showing herself to be the truest of friends to us, however she may have behaved to the impassioned lover in the novel. Then I added, Keep it up, good. I can't remember any more poetry. Curse away, there's a good fellow. Good responded nobly to this tax upon his inventive faculties. Never before had I the faintest conception of the breadth and depth and height of a naval officer's objugatory powers. For ten minutes he went on in several languages without stopping, and he scarcely ever repeated himself. Meanwhile the dark ring crept on, while all that great assembly fixed their eyes upon the sky and stared and stared in fascinated silence. Strange and unholy shadows encroached upon the moonlight. An ominous quiet filled the place. Everything grew still as death. Slowly, and in the midst of this most solemn silence, the minutes sped away. And while they sped, the full moon passed deeper and deeper into the shadow of the earth, as the inky segment of its circle slid in awful majesty across the lunar craters. The great pale orb seemed to draw near and to grow in size. She turned a coppery hue, then that portion of her surface which was unobscured as yet grew gray and ashen, and at length, as totality approached, her mountains and her plains were seen to be glowing luridly through a crimson gloom. On, yet on, crept the ring of darkness, it was now more than half across the blood-red orb. The air grew thick and still more deeply tinged with dusky crimson, and yet on, till we could scarcely see the fierce faces of the group before us. No sound rose now from the spectators, and at last Good stopped swearing. "'The moon is dying! The white wizards have killed the moon!' yelled the Prince Scraga at last." We shall all perish in the dark. And animated by fear or fury, or by both, he lifted his spear and drove it with all his force at Sir Henry's breast. But he forgot the mail shirts that the king had given us and which we wore beneath our clothing. The steel rebounded harmless, and before he could repeat the blow, Curtis had snatched the spear from his hand and sent it straight through him. Scragga dropped dead. At the sight, and driven mad with fear of the gathering darkness, and of the unholy shadow which, as they believed, 
was swallowing the moon, the companies of girls broke up in wild confusion and ran screeching for the gateways. Nor did the panic stop there. The king himself, followed by his guards, some of the chiefs in Gagool, who hobbled away after them with marvelous alacrity, fled for the huts, so that in another minute we ourselves, the would-be victim Fulata, Infadus, and most of the chiefs who had interviewed us on the previous night were left alone upon the scene, together with the dead body of Scraga, Twala's son. Chiefs, I said, we have given you the sign. If ye are satisfied, let us fly swiftly to the place of which ye spoke. The charm cannot now be stopped. It will work for an hour and the half of an hour. Let us cover ourselves in the darkness. Come, said Infadus, turning to go, an example which was followed by the odd captains, ourselves, and the girl Fulata, whom Good took by the arm. Before we reached the gate of the corral, the moon went out utterly, and from every quarter of the firmament the stars rushed forth into the inky sky. Holding each other by the hand, we stumbled on through the darkness. End of chapter 11 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 12 Before the Battle Luckily for us, Infadus and the chiefs knew all the paths of the great town perfectly, so that we passed by sideways unmolested, and notwithstanding the gloom, we made fair progress. For an hour or more we journeyed on, till at length the eclipse began to pass, and that edge of the moon which had disappeared the first became again visible. Suddenly, as we watched, there burst from it a silver streak of light, accompanied by a wondrous ruddy glow, which hung upon the blackness of the sky like a celestial lamp, and a wild and lovely sight it was. In another five minutes the stars began to fade, and there was sufficient light to see our whereabouts. We then discovered that we were clear of the town of Lu, and approaching a flat-topped hill measuring some two miles in circumference. This hill, which is of a formation common in South Africa, is not very high. Indeed, its greatest elevation is scarcely more than 200 feet. But it is shaped like a horseshoe, and its sides are rather precipitous and strewn with boulders. On the grass tableland at its summit is ample camping ground, which had been utilized as a military cantonment of no mean strength. Its ordinary garrison was one regiment of 3,000 men, but as we toiled up the steep side of that mountain in the returning moonlight, we perceived that there were several of such regiments encamped there. Reaching the tableland at last, we found crowds of men roused from their sleep, shivering with fear, and huddled up together in the utmost consternation at the natural phenomenon which they were witnessing. Passing through these without a word, we gained a hut in the center of the ground, where we were astonished to find two men waiting, laden with our few good and chattels, which of course we had been obliged to leave behind in our hasty flight. I sent for them, explained Infadus, and also for these, and he lifted up Good's long-lost trousers. With an exclamation of rapturous delight, Good sprang at them, and instantly proceeded to put them on. "'Surely my lord will not hide his beautiful white legs,' exclaimed Infadus regretfully. But Good persisted, and only once did the Kukuwana people get the chance of seeing his beautiful legs again. Good is a very modest man. Henceforward they had to satisfy their aesthetic longings with his one whisker, 
his transparent eye, and his movable teeth. Still gazing with fond remembrance at Good's trousers, Infadus next informed us that he had commanded the regiment to muster so soon as the day broke, in order to explain to them fully the origin and circumstances of the rebellion which was decided on by the chiefs, and to introduce to them the rightful heir of the throne, Ignosi. Accordingly, when the sun was up, the troops, in all some twenty thousand men, and the flower of the Kukuana army, were mustered on a large open space to which we went. The men were drawn up in three sides of a dense square, and presented a magnificent spectacle. We took our station on the open side of the square, and were speedily surrounded by all the principal chiefs and officers. These, after silence had been proclaimed, Infadus proceeded to address. He narrated to them in vigorous and graceful language, for like most Kukuanas of high rank, he was a born orator, the history of Ignosi's father, and of how he had been basely murdered by Twala the king, and his wife and child driven out to starve. Then he pointed out that the people suffered and groaned under Twala's cruel rule, instancing the proceedings of the previous night, when under pretense of their being evildoers, many of the noblest in the land had been dragged forth and wickedly done to death. Next he went on to say that the white lords from the stars, looking down upon their country, had perceived its trouble, and determined, at great personal inconvenience, to alleviate its lot. That they had accordingly taken the real king of the Kukuanas, Ignosi, who was languishing in exile, by the hand, and led him over the mountains. That they had seen the wickedness of Twala's doings, and for a sign to the wavering, and to save the life of the girl Fulata, actually, by the exercise of their high magic, had put out the moon and slain the young fiend Scraga, and that they were prepared to stand by them, and assist them to overthrow Twala, and set up the rightful king Ignosi in his place. He finished his discourse amidst a murmur of approbation. Then Ignosi stepped forward and began to speak. Having reiterated all that Infadus, his uncle, had said, he concluded a powerful speech in these words, O chiefs, captains, soldiers, and people, ye have heard my words. Now must ye make choice between me and him who sits upon my throne, the uncle who killed his brother and hunted his brother's child forth to die in the cold and the night. That I am indeed the king these, pointing to the chiefs, can tell you, for they have seen the snake about my middle. If I were not the king, would these white men be on my side with all their magic? Tremble, chiefs, captains, soldiers, and people. Is not the darkness they have brought upon the land to confound Twala and cover our flight, darkness even in the hour of the full moon, yet before your eyes? It is, answered the soldiers. I am the king, I say to you, I am the king, went on Ignosi, drawing up his great stature to its full and lifting his broad-bladed battle-axe above his head. If there be any man among you who says that it is not so, let him stand forth, and I will fight him now, and his blood shall be a red token that I tell you true. Let him stand forth, I say. And he shook the great axe till it flashed in the sunlight. As nobody seemed inclined to respond to this heroic version of Dilly Dilly, come and be killed, our late henchman proceeded with his address. I am indeed the king, and should ye stand by my side in the battle, if I win the day, ye shall go with me to victory and honor. I will give you oxen and wives, and ye shall take place of all the regiments, and if ye fall, I will fall with you. And behold, I give you this promise, that when I sit upon the seat of my fathers, bloodshed shall cease in the land." 
No longer shall ye cry for justice to find slaughter. No longer shall the witch-finder hunt you out so that ye may be slain without a cause. No man shall die, save he who offends against the law. The eating up of your kraals shall cease. Each one of you shall sleep secure in his own hut and fear naught, and justice shall walk blindfold throughout the land. Have ye chosen chiefs, captains, soldiers, and people? We have chosen, O king, came back the answer. It is well. Turn your heads and see how Twala's messengers go forth from the great town, east and west, and north and south, to gather a mighty army to slay me and you, and these my friends and protectors. Tomorrow, or perchance the next day, he will come against us with all who are faithful to him. Then I shall see the man who is indeed my man, the man who fears not to die for his cause, and I tell you that he shall not be forgotten in the time of spoil. I have spoken, O chiefs, captains, soldiers, and people. Now go to your huts and make you ready for war. There was a pause, till presently one of the chiefs lifted his hand and out rolled the royal salute. Coom! It was a sign that the soldiers accepted Ignosi as their king. Then they marched off in battalions. Half an hour afterwards we held a council of war, at which all the commanders of regiments were present. It was evident to us that before very long we should be attacked in overwhelming force. Indeed, from our point of vantage on the hill, we could see troops mustering, and runners going forth from Loo in every direction, doubtless to summon soldiers to the king's assistance. We had on our side about 20,000 men, composed of seven of the best regiments in the country. Twala, so Enfadus and the chiefs calculated, had at least thirty to thirty-five thousand on whom he could rely at present assembled in Lu, and they thought that by midday on the morrow he would be able to gather another five thousand or more to his aid. It was, of course, possible that some of his troops would desert and come over to us, but it was not a contingency which could be reckoned on. Meanwhile, it was clear that active preparations were being made by Twala to subdue us. Already strong bodies of armed men were patrolling round and round the foot of the hill, and there were other signs also of coming assault. Infadus and the chiefs, however, were of opinion that no attack would take place that day, which would be devoted to preparation and to the removal of every available means of the moral effect produced upon the minds of the soldiery by the supposed magical darkening of the moon. The onslaught would be on the morrow, they said, and they proved to be right. Meanwhile, we set to work to strengthen the position in all ways possible. Almost every man was turned out, and in the course of the day, which seemed far too short, much was done. The paths up the hill, that was rather a sanatorium than a fortress, being used generally as the camping place of regiments suffering from recent service in unhealthy portions of the country, were carefully blocked with masses of stones, and every other approach was made as impregnable as time would allow. Piles of boulders were collected at various spots to be rolled down upon an advancing enemy. Stations were appointed to the different regiments, and all preparation was made which our joint ingenuity could suggest. Just before sundown, as we rested after our toil, we perceived a small company of men advancing towards us from the direction of Lou, one of whom bore a palm leaf in his hand for a sign that he came as a herald. As he drew near, Ignosi, Infidus, one or two chiefs, and ourselves went down to the foot of the mountain to meet him. He was a gallant-looking fellow, wearing the regulation leopard-skin coat. "'Greetings!' he cried as he came near. 
the king's greetings to those who make unholy war against the king, the lion's greeting to the jackals that snarl around his heels. Speak, I said. These are the king's words. Surrender to the king's mercy ere a worse thing befall you. Already the shoulder has been torn from the black bull, and the king drives him bleeding about the camp. This cruel custom is not confined to the Kukuanas, but is by no means uncommon amongst African tribes on the occasion of the outbreak of war or any other important public event. Alan Quatermain. What are Twala's terms? I ask from curiosity. His terms are merciful, worthy of a great king. These are the words of Twala, the one-eyed, the mighty, the husband of a thousand wives, lord of the Kukuanas, keeper of the great road, Solomon's road, beloved of the strange ones who sit in silence at the mountains yonder, the three witches, calf of the black cow, elephant, whose tread shakes the earth, terror of the evildoer, ostrich, whose feet devour the desert, huge one, black one, wise one, king from generation to generation. These are the words of Twala. I will have mercy and be satisfied with a little blood. One in every ten shall die. The rest shall go free. But the white man, Incubu, who slew Scraga, my son, and the black man, his servant, who pretends to my throne, and Infadus, my brother, who bruised rebellion against me, these shall die by torture as an offering to the silent ones. Such are the merciful words of Twala. After consulting with the others a little, I answered him in a loud voice, so that the soldiers might hear, thus, Go back, thou dog, to Twala, who sent thee, and say that we, Ignosi, veritable king of the Kukuanas, Incubu, Buguan, and Makumazan, the wise ones from the stars who make dark the moon, Infadus of the royal house, and the chiefs, captains, and people here gathered, make answer and say that we will not surrender, that before the sun has gone down twice, Twala's corpse shall stiffen at Twala's gate, and Ignosi, whose father Twala slew, shall reign in his stead. Now go, ere we whip thee away, and beware how thou dost lift a hand against such as we are. The herald laughed loudly. Ye frighten not men with such swelling words, he cried out. Show yourselves as bold to-morrow, O ye who darken the moon. Be bold, fight, and be merry. Before the crows, pick your bones till they are whiter than your faces. Farewell. Perhaps we may meet in the fight. Fly not to the stars, but wait for me, I pray, white men. With this shaft of sarcasm he retired, and almost immediately the sun sank. That night was a busy one. For, weary as we were, so far as was possible by the moonlight, all preparations for the morrow's fight were continued, and messengers were constantly coming and going from the place where we sat in council. At last, about an hour after midnight, everything that could be done was done, and the camp, save for the occasional challenge of a sentry, sank into silence. Sir Henry and I, accompanied by Ignosi and one of the chiefs, descended the hill and made a round of the pickets. As we went, suddenly, from all sorts of unexpected places, spears gleamed out in the moonlight, only to vanish again when we uttered the password. It was clear to us that none were sleeping at their posts. Then we returned, picking our way warily through thousands of sleeping warriors, many of whom were taking their last earthly rest. The moonlight, flickering along their spears, played upon their features and made them ghastly. The chilly night wind tossed their tall and hearse-like plumes. There they lay in wild confusion, 
with arms outstretched and twisted limbs, their stern, stalwart forms looking weird and unhuman in the moonlight. "'How many of these do you suppose will be alive at this time tomorrow?' asked Sir Henry. I shook my head and looked again at the sleeping men, and to my tired and yet excited imagination it seemed as though death had already touched them. My mind's eye singled out those who were sealed to slaughter, and there rushed in upon my heart a great sense of the mystery of human life and an overwhelming sorrow at its futility and sadness. Tonight these thousands slept their healthy sleep. Tomorrow they, and many others with them, ourselves perhaps among them, would be stiffening in the cold, their wives would be widows, their children fatherless, and their place know them no more forever. Only the old moon would shine on serenely, the night wind would stir the grasses, and the wide earth would take its rest, even as it did eons before we were, and will do eons after we have been forgotten. Yet man dies not, whilst the world, at once his mother and his monument, remains. His name is lost, indeed, but the breath he breathed still stirs the pine tops on the mountains. The sound of the words he spoke yet echoes on through space. The thoughts his brain gave birth to we have inherited today. His passions are our cause of life. The joys and sorrows that he knew are our familiar friends. The end from which he fled aghast will surely overtake us also. Truly the universe is full of ghosts, not sheeted churchyard specters, but the inextinguishable elements of individual life, which having been can never die, though they blend and change, and change again forever. All sorts of reflections of this nature pass through my mind, for as I grow older I regret to say that a detestable habit of thinking seems to be getting a hold of me. While I stood and stared at those grim yet fantastic lines of warriors, sleeping, as their saying goes, upon their spears. Curtis, I said, I am in a condition of pitiable fear. Sir Henry stroked his yellow beard and laughed, and he answered, I have heard you make that sort of remark before, Quartermain. Well, I mean it now. Do you know, I doubt very much if one of us will be alive tomorrow night. We shall be attacked in overwhelming force, and it is quite a chance if we can hold this place. We'll give a good account of some of them, at any rate. Look here, Quartermain, this business is nasty, and one with which... Properly speaking, we ought not to be mixed up, but we are in for it, so we must make the best of our job. Speaking personally, I had rather be killed fighting than any other way, and now that there seems little chance of our finding my poor brother, it makes the idea easier to me. But fortune favors the brave, and we may succeed. Anyway, the battle will be awful, and having a reputation to keep up, we shall need to be in the thick of the thing. He made this last remark in a mournful voice, but there was a gleam in his eye which belied its melancholy. I have an idea Sir Henry Curtis actually likes fighting. After this, we went to sleep for a couple of hours or so. Just about dawn, we were awakened by Infadus, who came to say that great activity was to be observed in Lou and that parties of the king's skirmishers were driving in our outposts. We rose and dressed ourselves for the fray, each putting on his chain armor shirt, for which garments at the present juncture we felt exceedingly thankful. Sir Henry went the whole length about the matter and dressed himself like a native warrior. When you are in Kukuana land, do as the Kukuanas do, he remarked, 
as he drew the shining steel over his broad breast, which it fitted like a glove. Nor did he stop there. At his request, Infadus had provided him with a complete set of native war uniform. Round his throat he fastened the leopard-skin cloak of a commanding officer. On his brows he bound the plume of black ostrich feathers worn only by generals of high rank, and about his middle a magnificent mukha of white ox-tails. A pair of sandals, a leglet of goat's hair, a heavy battle-axe with a rhinoceros horn handle, a round iron shield covered with white ox-hide, and the regulation number of twalas or throwing knives, made up his equipment, to which, however, he added his revolver. The dress was no doubt a savage one, but I am bound to say that I seldom saw a finer sight than Sir Henry Curtis presented in this guise. It showed off his magnificent physique to the greatest advantage, and when Ignosi arrived presently arrayed in a similar costume, I thought to myself that I had never before seen two such splendid men. As for Good and myself, the armor did not suit us nearly so well. To begin with, Good insisted upon keeping on his new-found trousers, and a stout, short gentleman with an eyeglass, and with half of his face shaved, arrayed in a male shirt, carefully tucked into a very seedy pair of corduroys, looks more remarkable than imposing. In my case, the chain shirt being too big for me, I put it on over all my clothes, which caused it to bulge in a somewhat ungainly fashion. I discarded my trousers, however, retaining only my veldtskuns, having determined to go into battle with bare legs in order to be the lighter for running, in case it became necessary to retire quickly. The mail coat, a spear, a shield that I did not know how to use, a couple of twalas, a revolver, and a huge plume, which I pinned into the top of my shooting hat in order to give a bloodthirsty finish to my appearance, completed my modest equipment. In addition to all these articles, of course, we had our rifles, but as ammunition was scarce, and as they would be useless in case of a charge, we arranged that they should be carried behind us by bearers. When at length we had equipped ourselves, we swallowed some food hastily, and then started out to see how things were going on. At one point in the tableland of the mountain, there was a little copy of brown stone, which served the double purpose of headquarters and of a conning tower. Here we found Infadus surrounded by his own regiment, the Greys, which was undoubtedly the finest in the Kukuana army, and the same that we had first seen at the outlying corral. This regiment, now 3,500 strong, was being held in reserve, and the men were lying down on the grass in companies and watching the king's forces creep out of loo in long, ant-like columns. There seemed to be no end to the length of these columns, three in all, and each of them numbering, as we judged, at least eleven or twelve thousand men. As soon as they were clear of the town, the regiments formed up. Then one body marched off to the right, one to the left, and the third came on slowly towards us. Ah, said Infadus, they are going to attack us on three sides at once. This seemed rather serious news, for our position on the top of the mountain, which measured a mile and a half in circumference, being an extended one, it was important to us to concentrate our comparatively small defending force as much as possible. But since it was impossible for us to dictate in what way we should be assailed, we had to make the best of it, and accordingly sent orders to the various regiments to prepare to receive the separate onslaughts. End of chapter 12 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard 
Chapter 13 The Attack Slowly, and without the slightest appearance of haste or excitement, the three columns crept on. When within about 500 yards of us, the main or center column halted at the root of a tongue of open plain which ran up into the hill, to give time to the other divisions to circumvent our position, which was shaped more or less in the form of a horseshoe, with its two points facing towards the town of Lou. The object of this maneuver was that the threefold assault should be delivered simultaneously. Oh, for a gatling, groaned Good, as he contemplated the serried phalanxes beneath us. I would clear that plane in twenty minutes. We have not got one, so it is no use yearning for it. But suppose you try a shot, Quartermain, said Sir Henry. See how near you can go to that tall fellow who appears to be in command. Two to one you miss him, and an even sovereign to be honestly paid if we ever get out of this, that you don't drop that bullet within five yards. This piqued me, so loading the express with solid ball, I waited till my friend walked some ten yards out from his force, in order to get a better view of our position, accompanied only by an orderly. Then, lying down and resting the express on a rock, I covered him. The rifle, like all expresses, was only sighted to 350 yards, so to allow for the drop in trajectory I took him halfway down the neck, which ought I calculated to find him in the chest. He stood quite still and gave me every opportunity, but whether it was the excitement or the wind or the fact of the man being a long shot, I don't know. But this was what happened. Getting dead on, as I thought, a fine sight, I pressed, and when the puff of smoke had cleared away, to my disgust, I saw my man standing there unharmed, whilst his orderly, who was at least three paces to the left, was stretched upon the ground apparently dead. Turning swiftly, the officer I had aimed at began to run towards his men in evident alarm. "'Bravo, Quartermain!' sang out Good. "'You frightened him!' This made me very angry, for, if possible to avoid it, I hate to miss in public. When a man is master of only one art, he likes to keep up his reputation in that art. Moved quite out of myself at my failure, I did a rash thing. Rapidly covering the general as he ran, I let drive with the second barrel. Instantly the poor man threw up his arms and fell forward onto his face. This time I had made no mistake, and I say it as a proof of how little we think of others when our own safety, pride, or reputation is in question, I was brute enough to feel delighted at the sight. The regiments who had seen the feat cheered wildly at this exhibition of the white man's magic, which they took as an omen of success, while the force the general had belonged to, which indeed, as we ascertained afterwards, he had commanded, fell back in confusion. Sir Henry and Good now took up their rifles and began to fire, the latter industrially browning the dense mass before him with another Winchester repeater, and I also had another shot or two, with the result, so far as we could judge, that we put some six or eight men hors de combat before they were out of range. Just as we stopped firing, there came an ominous roar from our far right. Then a similar roar rose on our left. The other two divisions were engaging us. At the sound... The mass of men before us opened out a little and advanced towards the hill and up the spit of bare grassland at a slow trot, singing a deep-throated song as they ran. We kept up a steady fire from our rifles as they came, Ignosi joining in occasionally, and accounted for several men. But, of course, we produced no more effect upon that mighty rush of armed humanity than he who throws pebbles does on the breaking wave. On they came, with a shout and the clashing of spears, 
now they were driving in the pickets we had placed among the rocks at the foot of the hill. After that, the advance was a little slower, for though as yet we had offered no serious opposition, the attacking forces must climb uphill, and they came slowly to save their breath. Our first line of defense was about halfway down the side of the slope, our second fifty yards further back, while our third occupied the edge of the plateau. On they stormed, shouting their war cry, Twala, Twala, Chile, Chile, Twala, Twala, Smite, Smite. Ignosi, Ignosi, Chile, Chile, answered our people. They were quite close now, and the Twalas, or throwing knives, began to flash backwards and forwards, and now with an awful yell the battle closed in. To and fro swayed the mass of struggling warriors, men falling fast as leaves in an autumn wind. But before long the superior weight of the attacking forces began to tell, and our first line of defense was slowly pressed back till it merged into the second. Here the struggle was very fierce, but again our people were driven back and up, till at length, within twenty minutes of the commencement of the fight, our third line came into action. But by this time the assailants were very much exhausted, and besides had lost many men killed and wounded, and to break through that third impenetrable hedge of spears proved beyond their powers. For a while, the seething lines of savages swung backwards and forwards in the fierce ebb and flow of battle, and the issue was doubtful. Sir Henry watched the desperate struggle with a kindling eye, and then without a word he rushed off, followed by Good, and flung himself into the hottest of the fray. As for myself, I stopped where I was. The soldiers caught sight of his tall form as he plunged into battle, and there rose a cry of Nanzia Inkubu, Nanzia Unkungu Glovo. Here is the elephant. Chile, Chile. From that moment the end was no longer in doubt. Inch by inch, fighting with splendid gallantry, the attacking force was pressed back down the hillside, till at last it retreated upon its reserves in something like confusion. At that instant, too, a messenger arrived to say that the left attack had been repulsed, and I was just beginning to congratulate myself, believing that the affair was over for the present, when, to our horror, we perceived our men who had been engaged in the right defense being driven towards us across the plain, followed by swarms of the enemy who had evidently succeeded at this point. Ignosi, who was standing by me, took in the situation at a glance and issued a rapid order. Instantly the reserve regiment around us, the Greys, extended itself. Again Ignosi gave a word of command, which was taken up and repeated by the captains, and in another second, to my intense disgust, I found myself involved in a furious onslaught upon the advancing foe. Getting as much as I could behind Ignosi's huge frame, I made the best of a bad job, and toddled along to be killed as though I liked it. In a minute or two, we were plunging through the flying groups of our men, who at once began to reform behind us, and then I am sure I do not know what happened. All I can remember is a dreadful rolling noise of the meeting of shields and the sudden apparition of a huge ruffian whose eyes seemed literally to be staring out of his head, making straight at me with a bloody spear. But, I say it with pride, I rose, or rather sank, to the occasion. It was one before which most people would have collapsed once and for all. Seeing that if I stood where I was I must be killed, as the horrid apparition came I flung myself down in front of him, so cleverly that, being unable to stop himself, he took a header right over my prostrate form. Before he could rise again, I had risen and settled the matter from behind with my revolver. Shortly after this, somebody knocked me down, and I remember no more of that charge. When I came to, I found myself back at the copy, with Good bending over me, holding some water in a gourd. "'How do you feel, old fellow?' 
he asked anxiously. I got up and shook myself before replying. Pretty well, thank you, I answered. Thank heavens, when I saw them carry you in, I felt quite sick. I thought you were done for. Not this time, my boy. I fancy I only got a rap on the head, which knocked me stupid. How has it ended? They are repulsed at every point for a while. The loss is dreadfully heavy. We have quite two thousand killed and wounded, and they must have lost three. Look, there's a sight. And he pointed to the long lines of men advancing by fours. In the center of every group of four, and being borne by it, was a kind of hide tray, of which a Kukuana force always carries a quantity, with a loop for a handle at each end. On these trays, and their number seemed endless, lay wounded men, who, as they arrived, were hastily examined by the medicine men, of whom ten were attached to a regiment. If the wound was not of a fatal character, the sufferer was taken away and attended to as carefully as circumstances would allow. But if, on the other hand, the injured man's condition proved hopeless, what followed was very dreadful, though doubtless it may have been the truest mercy. One of the doctors, under pretense of carrying out an examination, swiftly opened an artery with a sharp knife, and in a minute or two the sufferer expired painlessly. There were many cases that day in which this was done. In fact, it was done in the majority of cases when the wound was in the body, for the gash made by the entry of the enormously broad spears used by the Kukuanas generally rendered recovery impossible. In most instances the poor sufferers were already unconscious, and in others the fatal nick of the artery was inflicted so swiftly and painlessly that they did not seem to notice it. Still, it was a ghastly sight, and one from which we were glad to escape. Indeed, I never remember anything of the kind that affected me more than seeing these gallant soldiers thus put out of pain by the red-handed medicine men. Except, indeed, on one occasion when, after an attack, I saw a force of Swazis burying their hopelessly wounded alive. Hurrying from this dreadful scene to the further side of the copy, we found Sir Henry, who still held a battle-axe in his hand, Ignosi, Enfadus, and one or two of the chiefs in deep consultation. "'Thank heaven, here you are, Quartermain. "'I can't quite make out what Ignosi wants to do. "'It seems that though we have beaten off the attack, "'Twala is now receiving large reinforcements "'and is showing a disposition to invest us "'with the view of starving us out. "'That's awkward. "'Yes, especially as Enfadus says "'that the water supply has given out. "'My lord, that is so.' said Infadus, the spring cannot supply the wants of so great a multitude, and it is failing rapidly. Before night we shall all be thirsty. Listen, Macumazahn, thou art wise, and hast doubtless seen many wars in the lands from whence thou camest, that is, if indeed they make wars in the stars. Now tell us, what shall we do? Twala has brought up many fresh men to take the place of those who have fallen. Yet Twala has learnt his lesson. The hawk did not think to find the hare unready, but our beak has pierced his breast. He fears to strike at us again. We too are wounded, and he will wait for us to die. He will wind himself round us like a snake round a buck, and fight the fight of sit-down. I hear thee, I said. So, Macumazan, thou seest we have no water here, and but a little food, and we must choose between these three things, to languish like a starving lion in his den, or to strive to break away towards the north, or, and here he rose and pointed towards the dense mass of our foes, to launch ourselves straight at Twala's throat. 
Inkubu, the great warrior, for today he fought like a buffalo in a net, and Twala's soldiers went down before his axe like young corn before the hail, and with these eyes I saw it. Inkubu says charge, but the elephant is ever prone to charge. Now what says Macumazan, the wily old fox, who has seen much and loves to bite his enemy from behind? The last word is in Ignosi, the king, for it is a king's right to speak of war. But let us hear thy voice, O Macumazan, who watches by night, and the voice, too, of him of the transparent eye. What sayest thou, Ignosi? I asked. Nay, my father, answered our quondam servant, who now, clad as he was in the full panoply of savage war, looked every inch a warrior king. Do thou speak, and let me, who am but a child in wisdom besides thee, hearken to thy words. Thus adjured, after taking hasty counsel with Good and Sir Henry, I delivered my opinion briefly to the effect that, being trapped, our best chance, especially in view of the failure of our water supply, was to initiate an attack upon Twala's forces. Then I recommended that the attack should be delivered at once, before our wounds grew stiff, and also before the sight of Twala's overpowering force caused the hearts of our soldiers to wax small like fat before a fire. Otherwise, I pointed out, some of the captains might change their minds, and making peace with Twala, desert to him, or even betray us into his hands. This expression of opinion seemed, on the whole, to be favorably received. Indeed, among the Kukuanas, my utterances met with a respect which has never been accorded to them before or since. But the real decision as to our plans lay with Ignosi, who, since he had been recognized as rightful king, could exercise the almost unbounded rights of sovereignty, including, of course, the final decision on matters of generalship, and it was to him that all eyes were now turned. At length, after a pause, during which he appeared to be thinking deeply, he spoke. Inkibu, Makumazan, and Buguan, brave white men, and my friends, Infadus, my uncle, and chiefs, my heart is fixed. I will strike at Twala this day and set my fortunes on the blow, I and my life, my life and your lives also. Listen, thus will I strike. Ye see how the hill curves round like the half moon, and how the plain runs like a green tongue towards us within the curve. We see, I answered. Good, it is now midday, and the men eat and rest after the toil of battle. When the sun has turned and traveled a little way towards the darkness, let thy regiment, my uncle, advance with one other down to the great tongue, and it shall be that when Twala sees it, he will hurl his force against it to crush it. But the spot is narrow, and the regiments can come against thee one at a time only. So may they be destroyed one by one, and the eyes of all Twala's army shall be fixed upon a struggle the like of which has not been seen by living man. And with thee, my uncle, shall go Inkubu, my friend, that when Twala sees his battle-axe flashing in the first rank of the greys, his heart may grow faint. And I will come with the second regiment, that which follows thee, so that if ye are destroyed as it might happen, there may yet be a king left to fight for, and with me shall come Macumazan the wise. It is well, O king, said Infadus, apparently contemplating the certainty of the complete annihilation of his regiment with perfect calmness. Truly these Kukuanas are a wonderful people. Death has no terror for them when it is incurred in the course of duty. And whilst the eyes of the magnitude of Twala's soldiers are thus fixed upon the fight, went on Ignosi, behold, one-third of the men who are left alive to us 
that is about six thousand, shall creep along the right horn of the hill, and fall upon the left flank of Twala's forces, and one third shall creep along the left horn, and fall upon Twala's right flank. And when I see that the horns are ready to toss Twala, then will I, with the men who remain to me, charge home in Twala's face. And if fortune goes with us, the day will be ours, and before night drives her black oxen from the mountains to the mountains, we shall sit in peace at Lou. And now let us eat and make ready, and in Fadus do thou prepare, that the plan be carried out without fail. And stay, let my white father, Buguan, go with the right horn, that his shining eye may give courage to the captains. The arrangements for attack thus briefly indicated were set in motion with a rapidity that spoke well for the perfection of the Kukuwana military system. Within little more than an hour, rations had been served out and devoured. The divisions were formed, the scheme of onslaught was explained to the leaders, and the whole force, numbering about 18,000 men, was ready to move, with the exception of a guard left in charge of the wounded. Presently Good came up to Sir Henry and myself. "'Good-bye, you fellows,' he said. "'I am off with the right wing, according to orders. "'And so I have come to shake hands in case we should not meet again, you know,' he added significantly. "'We shook hands in silence, and not without the exhibition of as much emotion as Anglo-Saxons are wont to show. "'It is a queer business,' said Sir Henry, his deep voice shaking a little. "'And I confess I never expect to see tomorrow's sun. "'So far as I can make out the greys with whom I am to go, "'are to fight until they are wiped out, "'in order to enable the wings to slip around unawares and outflank Twala. "'Well, so be it. "'At any rate, it will be a man's death. "'Good-bye, old fellow. God bless you. I hope you will pull through and live to collar the diamonds. But if you do, take my advice and don't have anything more to do with pretenders. In another second, Good had wrung us both by the hand and gone. And then Infadus came up and led off Sir Henry to his place in the forefront of the greys. Whilst with many misgivings, I departed with Ignosi to my station in the second attacking regiment. End of chapter 13